uh, give us um, uh, an insight to the origins of Christianity. Um, what kind of religion uh, did the Cometans uh, practice and have and its relationship to Christianity, if they are in it? Um, let's look at monotheism and uh, polytheistic uh, uh, concepts of uh, beliefs uh, as uh, one just opposed to the other. Um, and uh, let's look at Jesus and Osiris, uh, Isis and Mary's. Uh, let's look at the whole gamut. Uh, but let's start uh, with those, if you would. And uh, if you could, by giving us kind of a history of the origin of Christianity as it is projected in terms of Abraham coming out of the land of Ur, and who were those people, etc. So I've given you a big task. Okay. <laughs> I should let you go at it. All right, we'll start. Well, we'll start with kind of the origins of Christianity and how it came into being in the first place. Um, Christi Christianity derived out of Judaism, and, Ju and Judaism itself, um, its, his its history of its of its of its spirituality and its people is what we find written in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it talks about, uh, it has its beginnings with, um, in terms of individuals, with Abraham in the city of Ur, or, which was in Sumeria. So we find historically that the Jewish people take their history back to ancient Sumer, and um, that it, it all begins there. In Sumer, um, uh, which is part, which is on the Persian Gulf, which is part of the great Tigris Euphrates River valleys that um, historians refer to as Mesopotamia, um, has had a long history and uh, has been populated by many different peoples with different cultures and different traditions. Mm -hmm. The Sumerians that we usually think of. Um, were preceded even in the land of Sumer by other people who uh, the historians tell us were African people. And when we think about the Sumer of Abraham's day, we're already looking at a Mes Mesopotamia as a land of confluence, of racial mixing between mm -hmm. different racial groups of people. So the ancient Sumerians that, that uh, we know of from the land of Abraham are not necessarily an African people, but a people uh, brought about by the confluence of peoples in Mesopotamia. The biggest um, uh, thing that we have to look at for, for Sumer are the numerous writings that remain from Sumer. Uh, the Sumerians had a writing, uh, they wrote in the cuneiform script, and we have lot, oh, lots of, of written material, especially cosmologies, law text, uh, things to deal with laws, uh, stories, narratives, uh, letters from ancient Sumer. Mm -hmm. And when we look at their literature, uh, we see uh, a, a certain kind of cultural expression that mm -hmm. you don't find in Africa. Mm -hmm. The main theme in Mesopotamian literature is the struggle between good and evil. Mm -hmm. The light, light and darkness. That's the main theme in all of the literature, and um, you don't find we don't have the same theme occurring in Kemet. But anyway, if Abraham came out of what would be some of the uh, themes that are reoccurring in, in Egyptian cosmology? Can we just oppose those to see the difference? Okay. There I, weren't life and yeah, we can there weren't that. good and evil. What were they? Um. Well, in Mesopotamia, let, let's just look at that first. Mm -hmm. What we have is a lot of struggles and fighting between their gods or spirits. Um, we begin to see stories where uh, one god will kill his mother and devour her uh, and struggles between demons, there was, there was a concept of demons, there was a concept of, of, um, of eternal uh, damnation, 
there were concepts of of this constant struggle between good and evil that we find. But a lot of the things that a lot of the themes that we later see, even in Greek mm -hmm. uh, cosmology and tales, we find early in Mesopotamia, in, in Sumer, Babylon, Akkadia. Um, so let us um, contrast that with what we have in, what we find in Kemet. Mm -hmm. In Kemet, there is no struggle anywhere between good and evil in any in the cosmologies. The cosmology of Kemet, um, all um, among the, the 15 or so different cosmologies that we have from Kemet, all of them basically talk about the process of creation is coming out of new coming into the, and the elements that are involved in that process of creation. But nowhere are there stories of gods fighting other gods and and struggles with demonic forces and evil forces. There are no stories like that at all um, in the co committed cosmologies. Can I ask you about the uh, uh at the temple of, uh, uh, well, and anyway, the, the Dr. Ben had pointed out to us that this was an example of the literature existing a long time ago when Seth uh, and Horace fight, um, uh, and Horace overcomes uh, Seth, which was a god, he doesn't kill him. But uh, inscribed on that temple, I think it's Kumbo, one of those temples, mm -hmm. is a, uh, um, a depiction of a struggle between mm -hmm. Horace uh, and his uncle Seth, in which he overcomes him and is given, uh, uh, becomes the resurrected one. Mm -hmm. The story of Heru and Satesh um, is one that's really particularly important for, for, for scholars to study because I think that when we interpret it, that we basically interpret it from our own frame of reference, from a Western frame of reference, mm -hmm. because that's what we know about in Western society, the struggle between uh, something that's evil versus something that's good, mm -hmm. and uh, the good uh, uh, overcoming, I guess, ultimately, that which is evil, although that's mm -hmm. not the way it always happens in Western stories and uh, myths and tales. But the story um, of Heru and Satesh has many different forms, going back to the pyramid text where we first encounter it, mm -hmm. where we never hear of a struggle between Heru and Satesh in, at all. In the earliest versions of the story, Usir drowns in, his wa in the water, drowns, and he's not murdered <laughs> or killed by Satesh. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of him being murdered or killed by Satesh comes only with uh, Plutarch's version at the very end of Kemetic history, where Plutarch, who was a Greek geographer who went uh, throughout Kemet during the Greco-Roman period, mm -hmm. uh, 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 preparing the geography of the country, listened to the oral tales of the people, and that is one of the tales that he wrote down that he heard. Um, the version that he that he presents to us is um, from 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 the oral tradition of the late period, and how Plutarch interpreted it or understood it was probably from his Western frame of reference, um, kind of trying to relate it back to what he knew from mm. from his own experience and his own worldview. Mm. But in Kemet. We don't ever hear of the word of, of Set murdering Usir and killing him. And, this, and, and so the story um, needs to be placed in its own context and mm -hmm. looked, at, looked at it from a hermetic point of view. And the earliest traditions of it, where Usir drowns, is probably the most stable <coughs> tradition of that story that we need to be looking at. But we do have a concept of Peru and Setesh. And what may appear to be a struggle between them, because we hear of, in the comedic literature, of Heru gaining the kingship 
over Satesh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when we encounter it in the literature, it's in a political mode, talking about the leadership of the country, um, and uh, reflecting upon the fact that Heru is the symbol or symbolism for the leader of the country, the Nasubiri, i.e. the king, is Peru, and uh, Satesh, I'm not really sure that we actually know what he represents, but uh, the forces that would, the forces that perhaps should not be in a leadership position, and Peru overcoming that. Um, but the form of the story, even as Plutarch wrote it, was from a political, was in a political context, and that is the gaining of the kingship, the struggle between Heru and Satesh and Heru gaining the leadership of the country. But we also encounter the story in, in another way, and that is in a co cosmological way. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we have in the pyramid text. In the pyramid text, it's part of the cosmology. We're not talking about the politics of the country there, but it's part of the, the whole process of creation. And um, one of my, my own personal thoughts on it is that um, the struggle represents, there, there are three elements involved, Usir, which is, symbolizes the coming into being, the renewal and the rebirth, and Satesh, which is a complement or a counterpart of Usir in the literature, perhaps means that which is decaying and passing away. And the struggle then in life, the life cycle, really is about that which is coming into being, growing, developing, and then beginning the process of fading away, decaying, <coughs> only to come into being again. I think that that maybe if we look, if we really look harder and, and begin to study, and to study that literature, that that's what we begin to see. It's really happening with the struggle between the seer and Satesh. It's, this is all symbolism in the first place. It's all symbolic. There was never, there were never human beings, Usir, who the Greeks call Osiris, and Aset, Isis, and Heru, whom the Greeks call Horus. There were never, these were never human beings. This is part of the cosmology, it's part of the pyramid text. Mm -hmm. And it's part of, and then the stories begin to realize other levels because in Kemet everything can be conceived of on more than one level, on a cosmological level, on a human level, um, on a political level. So we can't just we can't take that story seriously in terms of, um, of the form that Plutarch anyway mm -hmm. gave to us. Can we, while we are, we're dealing with these um, uh, ancient uh, uh, stories, uh, what about uh, Husir and Oset uh, and that struggle with the brother where he was cut up into fourteen mm -hmm. pieces, and of course which led to what. Putra, uh, Putra later says was a uh, uh, the revenge of the son to uh, mm -hmm. or his father. Uh, in none of the literature can you find the statements that he cut up the body of Lucia into into fourteen pieces. You can't find that. The only thing you can find in the literature so far is the fact that. Um, uh, and it's really from the very late period that you, you see uh, Aset gathering up the, the pieces or the parts of Lucia's body. So the story over, uh, let's say, an 8,000 year history, historical written period in Kemet went through many changes and you know, had many developments of its own. Mm -hmm. But um, I really think that the more valid story to look at is the one from the, from the Old Kingdom rather than its later developments. But um, to take Plutarch's version is not, to, is not a good idea simply because of, of the connotations that are on it and the, and the frame of reference with which it comes. And you just cannot find that explicitly stated 
in the Kemetic literature, and there are many versions of it that we have in many different texts from many different periods. Could you just briefly, if you could, give us an overview of what the story says? In um, would, would you kind of give us an overview of the uh, differences between uh, the old kingdom version and what uh, Prutrek Prutrek may have written or wrote <laughs> <laughs> okay um, here's a here's a version from a middle kingdom text and uh, this is the story that we find from the old kingdom through much of the middle kingdom the version of the story goes as follows uh, it says, Granary of the Netter Tat Tachinen. In the great seat that rejoices the Netteru in the house of Ptah, the mistress of all life, through which the life of the two lands is provided. For Usir was floating in his water, and Aset and Nebethet looked and saw him and attended him. Haru immediately ordered Aset and Nebethet to seize Usir and prevent him from drowning. They turned their hands in time, and so they brought him to land. He entered the inaccessible portals into the sanctity of the Lords of Perpetuity, in the steps of him who raises, rises in the horizon on the course of Ra in the great seat. He joined with the palace and became associated with the Netaru Tachinen Hata, the Lord of the Years. So did Usir become earth in fort of, of officials on the north side of this land, which he had reached, while his son Haru had appeared as king of Upper Kemet, had appeared as king of Lower Kemet in the embrace of his father Usir and the Netaru before and after him. Mm -hmm. So that is um, an old version. Mm -hmm. And as I said before, in the old version, um, there's never, there's not a talk of struggle between Setesh and Yusir. Mm -hmm. But in the Ramesside, in the Ramesside papyrus, um, we find a different version of the story. It doesn't, in the Ramesside papyrus, which is in such, Critical shape, condition. Mm -hmm. So much of it is missing, but enough is there to get the gist of it, the whole thing. Um, we find that Aset and Nebethet are asked to collect the pieces or the limbs of Usir, and we hear a, a lot about the struggle between, well, the, the 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 fact that the kingship is given to Heru instead of given to Set. Mm -hmm. And at this period would have been again uh, uh, the Ramesside where this change takes place that would have been what? In the late period. In the late in period. The late period. Mm -hmm. okay. But we have such a development of the story. I'm sure that if we dug up everything from ancient Kemet or had much more material than we do today, we'd, we'd be able to see a development in, in not just this story, but many, of, many other of the cosmos cosmological stories that were told. But to take uh, the version of Plutarch from the um, Greco-Roman period and to to turn it into Kemetic uh, philosophy or theology, or even to represent um, the Kemetic uh, story, we can't do that. Let, let's look at more of the uh, differences we were talking about, the origins of Christianity. I don't know if we exhausted that. No, we didn't, we okay. didn't exhaust that. That's a long story. <laughs> All right, can we? But I'll, we'll make it short. All right. <laughs> um, Christianity uh, derives out of Judaism. Um, in Ju Judaism, it's not one thing or one one unified uh, set or unified theology or unified group of people. It's many different people uh, who have a basic um, political worldview 
and to have a basic doctrine um, that they adhere to. And in ancient times, there were lots of um, disagreements between a lot of different aspects of Judaism, between the laws, between, between its politics, between its doctrines, um, the way it was to be worshipped, the way it was to be practiced. Um, you have a lot of that even today. And in ancient times, you had break-off groups. Um, even though there wasn't any real central group the, group, the group of people who lived in Judah, Judah was considered like the, the center of, of Jewish faith. Um, there were a lot of break-off groups from that, and for, different, for, for various reasons. And from that derived a group of people who, um, who are the founders really of, of what we call today Christianity. Um, right at the end of the Greco-Roman period in Kemet and the beginning of the Roman period in, in, um, in the world, really, um, we find the beginnings of Christianity stirring up. For example, when the Greeks came into Kemet, um, we found a group of, of uh, followers of this new faith, or this break-off Jewish faith, who had more or less set up house in different parts of Kemet and particularly in Alexandria and other main spots where Greek people were settled in, in the country. And they were practicing this new faith, um, which was based upon the idea of, of, a, of a one God concept, and which was different for Kemet and for the Near East as well. Because even in Judaism, you have if I can use the word polytheistic, even though it's not a good word to use, but you have a belief in many different gods and goddesses. As a matter of fact, the word Elohim in Hebrew is plural. Elohim is, is plural for gods. Mm -hmm. And there were many different Elohim, not just one. Mm -hmm. So what, one of the, one of the um, uh, disagreements, I suppose, rose from from the one God concept that this new group of people had. They also were talking about the coming of the Messiah. That was a big, a big thing and an important aspect of Judaism from, from its most ancient times and its inception, and that is the whole idea of a Messiah. A Messiah who is going to come and save Israel. A Messiah who is going to become, who is going to come one day in the future. This is prophetic, prophetic. And, and lead the people and govern the people in the most righteous way. So this idea was carried on by several group, break-off groups of, of Jews, and that's the whole idea of the Messiah coming, who is going to be the leader of Israel. And um, the group of people who, who became Christians carried this idea in a very strong way and carried the one God idea in a very strong way as well. Um, the idea of one God has its origins, however, in Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. The first time we really see the idea of one God developing in Mesopotamia was in Babylon, in the old Babylonian kingdom under, mm -hmm. during the time of Hammurabi. And we find at that period of time, there was, there was, um, uh, a movement to elevate Marduk, who was one of one of the gods in their pantheon, to be the supreme god, the leader of all the gods, the god of gods over all of the others. And the reason for that is because uh, Babylon and many of its surrounding nations had similar pantheons of gods. Mesopotamia at the time was the most powerful nation in that area. And one of the ways that they discovered to maintain their power was to have a single god ahead of all the other gods that everyone was supposed to worship. And by everyone worshiping this one god as the head of the pantheon, they too would be following in the path of, of Babylon, 
it would consolidate its power, which it already had political power in the area, but it would further consolidate its power um, by having everyone uh, subjugate themselves to this one god, Marduk. And that, in fact, did happen in Mesopotamia. They were the most powerful nation in the area for several hundred years. And Marduk was, was their main consolidating force. And the Jewish people who lived in, lived in Mesopotamia, many of them who lived in Babylon and Akkadia and all of the surrounding areas, um, begin to realize that the one, begin to realize this one God concept themselves and begin to carry it, and certain groups of them begin to, to perpetuate this idea further, even though the Jewish people themselves always, um, in ancient times, believed in the Elohim, which is the plural gods that they had. So what we have here is a political movement to, to subjugate people under, or bring people together under a one god concept. That's what you have in Mesopotamia. And that idea then is carried on by several breakoff groups of Jewish people elevating or conceiving of a concept of one God. Perhaps realizing, as the Babylonians did, the political power behind such an endeavor as that. Then what we need to do um, is we need to look at who the Jewish people are. I mean, who are the uh, Hebrews and, and how did they become uh, and how, what impact did they have on Egypt? I mean, at some point, the story takes on a reality in that uh, whether it was before they left Egypt or whether they were there or not, but at some point, they become. So let's see if we can find the myth, uh, separate the myth from the reality. Who are they? Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. And uh, um, did they have any any relationship or any origins in um, Ethiopia? Mm -hmm. uh, any relationship? Right, any relationship. I think it's. I think we can be absolutely certain that they came from Sumeria, that they came from from Mesopotamia, because there's no reason in the world to doubt to doubt their history of themselves, which is the Old Testament. Okay. And in the Old Testament, we all know about Abraham coming from Chaldea, coming from uh, Sumeria, and and moving on. Up, up the Mesopotamian uh, rivers and, and spreading out throughout the whole area, Palestine, um, Syria, Iran, Iraq, the whole area. There's no reason at all to doubt that that story is not true because there isn't any other version of their history other than that. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said before, whether or not they were black people at the time of Abraham is doubtful by that. We know that there was a there was a pre-Sumerian culture, absolutely without a doubt. We know that there was a pre-Sumerian culture, and we can assume that that culture, that group of people, were African people. But by the time we find Sumer, we find a, the literature expressing the ideas that are foreign to African people. Some of the ideas which I mentioned a few minutes ago. So we can see that we don't have a purely African people in Abraham and this group of Hebrews. When it, come, when it comes to the time of Kemet and we get to the point of Kemet, they themselves, in their own history, the Old Testament, say that they in fact were in, that they were in Egypt. That they were in Egypt under the time, during the reign of Ramesses. They say that in their Bible. But, from the Kemetic side of the story, we hear nothing of any Israelites or Hebrew people. And that's interesting simply because the Kemites did name all of the people that they came in contact with. Um, in all of the various historical pieces of literature we have, they're always naming all the people that they feed and they come in contact with. Um, but let's just say, so we, from the Kemetic side, we don't hear about them. But from their own side, from their own, in their own story, in their own words, they were there, um, in bondage, as slaves, building pyramids, 
Um, well, building cities. Building cities. <laughs> um, that they were there, and that they uh, that they worshipped. Also, what we read in the Old Testament is they worshipped a different god. That they, well, it says that they really, I guess, worshipped the 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 um, quote gods of the Egyptians, especially the bull, the Apis bull, which at the time, which during the time of the late period, was the form of was was a form or a practice that was going on in Kemet. And that's the, the, the apis as a symbol, as a neteru. And um, the great uh, uh, praises and rituals that were done around the apis bull in the very late period of Kemetic history. Um, so they knew, about, they knew about that story and they knew that the Egyptians had this apis bull in, in their, in their uh, spiritual practices but they didn't seem to really, they didn't write about it in, in the Old Testament and they didn't really seem to understand anything about it except that they said that the Egyptians worshipped the bull. Um, what can we see in their, in, their, in their Old Testament that they might have carried over in, from Kemet into when they left, when they supposedly left Kemet? Um, what is in the Old Testament that you can see comparable to that? The story, the Old Testament is basically a book of law. It's a, it's a history book, but the vast majority of it is laws talking about um, how people should live, the rules for the lives that govern the lives of everyday people. It talks about the, the rules for the priesthood. It's, it sets up the church. It sets up the it's, it sets up the church and how the priests are supposed to act, how they're supposed to do sacrifices, how they're supposed to do purifications. Um, that's mainly what it's about. And as a matter of fact, it derives the Talmud, which is a, a Jewish book of laws, is part of that Old Testament group of books. And those same laws, which is the vast majority of the Old Testament, um, how do they apply to Kemet, and do you find the same kind of laws in Kemet? That's what I want. First of all, well, there's, there's several approaches to it. One thing, the Kemites themselves did not have a written body. They never wrote laws down in terms of governing how people shall live their lives. The law underlying comedic society, or the rule underlying comedic society in terms of how you should govern your lives was an unspoken law that was understood by people, and that is ma'at. Comedic society functioned by ma'at. It was a principle that was taught from the time you were born till the time you died in terms of how people will relate to each other and how people will will relate to nature, was governed by Ma'at. Also, the leadership of the country was also governed by that concept of Ma'at as well. Mm -hmm. Because Heru, the Nasir Bidi, was supposed to be the representative leader of Ma'at on the planet, on Earth, in Kemet. Mm -hmm. We have three main treatises on kingship from Kemet mm -hmm. that tell, talk about what the duties of the Nasibidi are. And in all of them, the main duty of the, of the Nasibidi is to be the upholder of Ma'at in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Nowhere, of course, in, in the Jewish laws, in Numbers, Deuteronomy, in, in, in the several books of Jewish laws that we have in the Old Testament, do we ever hear of such a concept. Um, but we have real specific laws, like if a man sleeps with another man's wife, the wife will be killed, should be killed, and the man should be should pay ten mina of gold to the husband. If a man steals another man's cow and uh, kills it, he should replace the cow with three cows. In terms of how people uh, governing people's exact lives, 
with specific rules for almost everything that will cover your everyday life and crimes and things that can go wrong. That's what you have in Deuteronomy. That's what you have in Numbers. For the laws of the priesthood as well. Do we have the same kind of priests in Kemet who are required to do the same kind of priestly functions that the priests of Israel had to do? The priests, do we have, do we have the same kind of priests that we have in the priests of Israel? Um, let us look at that. The priests of Israel, there are many sacrifices, different kinds of sacrifices that are listed in the Talmud. But those same kinds of sacrifices we don't have they didn't have in commit, they didn't do in commit. As a matter of fact, the meaning of sacrifice was different in commit, and the ways in which it was done was different in commit as well. Just a glaring example, in Israel, there were burnt sacrifices. So that if you slaughtered a lamb, you were to burn it. Or if you slaughtered anything as a sacrifice, it was to be burned, it was to be devoured by fire. In Kemet, there was no such thing as burnt sacrifice. There are no burnt sacrifices. It appears that in Kemet, things that were offered on the offering table were, were eaten. And when animals were slaughtered in Kemet, the bulls and the, um, the calves and the different animals that were slaughtered and placed upon the offering table, it appears from the different literature and, and texts that we have that they were eaten but absolutely, is it nev it's never mentioned anywhere that they were ever burned, and never do we see a picture of that. But yet from ancient Israel, um, and from ancient Judaism, we hear of the burnt sacrifice. Um, also, the meaning and purpose of sacrifice appear to have been different in Kemet. We see lots of passage of ritual of sacrifices for the sake of passage from this life to the next life, as you might say, at death, to renew the life of a deceased person, a bull will be slaughtered, um, and the, the reason for slaughtering the bull is to kill or destroy death before it's allowed to reach the person. And we find that also in other uh, places in East Africa, the same thing. But you do not anywhere in Judaism have a ritual such as that, a ritual sacrifice for that purpose. So once again, scholars need to look at um, the, the, and do a comparison between the priest of Israel and the priest of Kemet. And another thing, the priests of Israel were dedicated to, to Yahweh or Elohim. They were, they were dedicated to a different set of gods or, or spirits than the Kemites were. As a matter of fact, when Moses, in the story, when Moses brings the Israelites out of Kemet, what he is basically telling them is that now we're going to worship one God. We're going to worship one God now. And in Numbers, the whole priestly issue is set up for the worship of that one God. And in Kemet, there's no such thing. There's no one God concept or God concept as it was known in Israel. The, the, the one God concept that we have the Jews at this period um, developing is the same one God concept that we found developed in in Mesopotamia. That's the God of Exodus 20 that, you know, that, that we find. Um, I, I want to come back to this, but I want to kind of look at um, I have heard as you have stated that the mixture of the Caucasians or Cassipoids or those people who were trapped in the ice and began to come back down into the warmer climate, had no concepts of religion, um, of the kinds of culture that African people had. But in the mixing and, and in the uh, overrunning of those people in the northern areas of Africa, uh, around Iran and, and coming on down, 
that these laws were given to them because we're in Africa, and, and I'd like you, if you can, speak of this. In Africa, you didn't have those strict laws. You should not do this, you should not do that, because it was it was a culture or a society where people, right. generation had been broke. Right. So that, right. But for these people, right. you know, you had to have laws, you had to tell them, you had to explain right. to them. Right. Everything had to be laid right. out right. specifically. And because you didn't have total control over them, because they most of the time were the victors and were pushing Africans back and mixing and mm -hmm. setting up their cultures, perhaps you can kind of go through that um, phase mm -hmm. as you have made interpreted, I have, you have come to your own conclusions. Right. First of all, the, the, the Caucasian people who came out of the steppes and moved south had, had a very strong culture of their own, had very strong traditions of their own, had very strong belief systems of their own. They were not the same as that of African people, but they were very strong belief systems that they had. One of the main aspects of their, of their, of their um, belief system was that nature itself was hostile and evil because it was hostile in a colder environment. There was a lot that they had to fight against um, environmentally. So they believed they had, they had gods or spirits, spirits of the light, spirits of the dark, spirits of the wind, spirits of the sea, spirits of they had many, many demonic spirits that were considered to be evil, and many of them were nature kinds of spirits, like the ocean, like the wind, like the cold. They had many different. They had they had many different spirits whom they named, whom they had names for, so that they had a setup of their own gods or spirits. The European, the Western scholars refer to these as pantheons, which is a collection of gods or spirits that a people have. The Europeans, out of the steppes, had this. And, and along with it, they had stories about their gods. They had rituals and rites that they did to their gods, particularly to the gods that represented evil forces, they had many different rituals that they did to try to pacify their, their, um, the, the, evil, the evil spirits and the, and, the, and the evil gods and to kind of create some balance and harmony in, in their lives. And we find the beginnings of this in Sumeria, actually, in terms of having had it written down on paper. The Sumerians wrote a lot about their, their gods. And they had, most of their gods are evil, represent evil things, and that need to be ritually pacified often in order to, to establish some peaceful coexistence on this planet. And then after the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Akkadians, the Curians, everyone, these people do have a very strong culture and belief system of their own. And and when they come, when they came into, when they moved south, they carried these belief systems with them, this, their culture and their traditions with them, which they were so strongly emerged in and believed in. When they, when they came in contact with Africans with a completely different belief system and, and worldview and way of life than their own, um, they did not readily adopt and accept the African way. But they maintain to this day, to this very day, their own, their own belief system, i.e. that nature is harsh, that nature is hard, that nature needs to be conquered. The whole idea that nature needs to be conquered because it's hard and it's harsh and it's uncompromising, that is not the view that African people have. And that is the view that they've had from, from time immemorial, from their very beginning. They never let go of that. So coming in contact with African people doesn't, doesn't offer them something better, but it's simply they've always held on to their own belief system. 
When they came into Kemet, they did not adopt the Kemetic way of life. In their, in their own Old Testament, they call it evil. They call it evil. Moses has got to get away, not only because the people are in bondage, because they are not allowed to worship their own gods. And the god of the Egyptians is pagan, it's evil, and they had to move away from that. The reason that you, that you really are reading in the Old Testament, beyond the fact that Israel needs a place of its own, politically to call its own, but also, it needs to be able to set up its own institutions, its own culture, its own tradition, and its own belief system, separate from that of Kemet. The whole move is always away from Kemet. So to think that they took anything out, that they took something from Kemet, there's no reason for us to even deal with that, or even to, to even consider that, because they themselves are always telling us that their move is away from that because that's evil and that's bad. And what they set up is based upon the same old traditions that you find in Sumeria, Babylon, and even before they came down into the southern area. Their, their belief system that, 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 there's, that nature is evil, bad, and hard. It must be conquered. It must be controlled. And their the evil spirits and demons have to be have to be continuously pacified. This is awful interesting, and it is primary evidence. What I want you to do, I want to look at some of their gods, some of their belief systems. Okay. Um, Let's do that more now. directly because okay. that's important. All right. What we have here is a very good example of a Mesopotamian creation story where they talk about their gods, their pantheon, and their, um, how they feel life came into being, man's place on earth, man's relationship to the gods. And I'm reading from this book, In the Beginning, by Virginia um, Hamilton. It's a collection of creation stories from around the world. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to introduce two other books the Ancient Near East, which is translated by Pichard, James B. Pichard, which is the major reference source on Mesopotamian literature. It's a translation of different kinds of literature from Mesopotamia. There are two volumes of this, Sumerian translations of Sumerian, Cuneiform, Babylonian, Akkadian, and um, various other nations of Mesopotamia. And the story I'm about to read is also found in Pritchard's translation as well. The, these stories have been translated by many different people, scholars. This is very famous. It's called Inuma Elish, which means what is on high. And it begins, what is on high had not been named and firm ground below had not been called. There was but Apsu, the begetter, the fresh and sweet water sea. And there was Tiamat, the salt water, the salt sea waters. They mingled as a single body and soul. There was no hut of reeds, no marshlands. There was Apsu and Tiamat, and nothing else. They created the great gods. They brought the gods Lahmu and Lahamu into being. And for ages, these two grew and grew. The gods Ansar and Kishar were formed next, and they grew even taller. The god Anu was their son. He was equal to his father, Ansar, Anshar. Anu brought the god Ea into being. Ea was wise, understanding, and strong. He was even mightier than his grandfather, Anshar. There was no there was none to rival him among the gods. The god brothers banded together in the sweet and salt waters as more of them came to be. They surged back and forth. This bothered Tiamat. Some say she was a dragon. The god's sons made her moody with their noise and laughter. Apsu could not stop the brother of gods, and Tiamat could not speak to them 
for they were too overbearing. Apsu decided to destroy them so that he and Tiamat could have peace. What, should we unmake what we have made? Tiamat asked. Her mood was dark now. Their way was awful. These gods, but let us act kindly. Apsu continued to plan evil against the gods, his sons. But the gods heard what he plotted. They became silent, all but one. He was Ea, the all-wise. Ea made a spell. He spoke the magic, and he put it in the deep of the fresh water of the Apsu. His spell made Apsu fall sound asleep, and then Ea killed him. Ea and Dam. Kina, his wife, dwelled in splendor in the watery place of, the, of fate. They called it Apsu. And in the heart of Apsu was created the majestic god Marduk. It was Ea and Damika's doing. They were the father and the mother. Marduk looked like a god of gods for all time. His eyes flashed and sparked, leader that he was. He walked like the Lord of the Ages. When Ea first saw him, his heart was filled with rejoicing. He said Marduk was perfect and to be praised for the most, as the Most High God. Marduk had four eyes and four ears. When his lips moved, the fire blazed from within. His eyes scanned everything. He was fearless and radiant. He was best and tallest, boldest and bravest. My little son, my little son, exclaimed Ea. My son, the son, Eshuin, son of the heavens. Marduk was the son of all, of all. The god Anu then made the four winds. They in turn brought waves and foam to Tiamat's water. Diving down, Anu filled his palm and created dirt. Waves stirred up the dirt. Tiamat did not like being upset and so disturbed. She moved and moved day and night. The gods could not rest. We cannot sleep, they said. You let Apsu be killed and did not stay at his side. Now there are four winds. You are alone. We cannot rest. You do not love us. Let us make monsters, then Tiamat said. She who could fashion all things gave birth to monster serpents who made roaring dragons, bloodless and filled with poison. And she crowned them with halos, so they would look like gods. Looking upon them, the onlooker would perish. Tiamat created the viper, the dragon, and the sphinx, the great lion, the mad dog, and the scorpion man. She created demons, the dragonfly, the centaur, there were 11 of them that she made herself, and among these creatures, she made Kingu. Tiamat made Kingu the chief of the monsters, and they would battle now against the fair gods, An Anshar and Ea, and Anu. They would avenge the death of Apsu. Anu went to stand against Tiamat and her terrible dark brood, but Anu could not withstand her. He had to retreat, and Ea called his son Marduk, and Lord Marduk was pleased. He prepared himself, and he stood before the fair god Anshar. I will accomplish all that is in your heart, said Marduk. I will be your avenger and slay Tiamat. But you must make me supreme. From, from now on, my words will fix the destiny of the gods and whatever I create will remain unchanged. So the gods agreed to grant Marduk kingship of the universe. But first, they spread the starry, abor uh, uh, starry robe of the night sky in their midst. The gods said to Marduk, by your word, make the robe vanish. Marduk spoke in words of sun and light, and the robe vanished. By your word, said the gods, let the robe appear again. Marduk spoke in the words of night and stars, and the robe was seen again. The gods rejoiced. Marduk is king, they cried. 
Then Marduk made ready for battle. He took up his scepter the gods had given him, his royal ring and his thunderbolt. He took up his bow and arrow and his club. He placed lightning in front of him and made his body full of flame. He made a net to trap Tiamat. The four winds helped him so she could not get away. He bought evil winds, whirlwinds, and hurricanes to stir up the waters of Tiamat. He rode his terrifying chariot of rage. To this he tied his four team, the killer, the crusher, the unyielder, and fleet. Lord Marduk went forward, wrapped in armor, his head dressed in a turbanal halo. He went face to face, fierce Tiamat. He had magic in his mouth and a root against poison in his hand. The gods milled all around him. He went forward and looked inside of Tiamat. You have put Kingu in the place of rule of Anu and against Anshar, king of the gods. Stand up now and fight me. Tiamat, Tiamat cried out in fury. She cast her spells. The Lord Martyr spread his net to entrap her. She screamed out a poison. Then Marduk unleashed an evil wind. Tiamat spread her mouth to eat him. He drove the evil wind down her water spout. Marduk let loose his arrow. It cut Tiamat in half. Lord Marduk stood above Tiamat as she died. Her monsters and demons trembled with terror. Marduk captured them and smashed their weapons. When these dark gods cried out, Marduk crushed them underfoot. Turning back to cold Tiamat, Marduk raised one half of her on high. He made it the heavens. Then he surveyed the Apsu of Ea, his father in the deep waters. The other half of the dead Tiamat he made the earth as a great abode above the Apsu. Marduk the Victorious made the days of the year in the order of the planets and the moon, moods of the moon. He made constellations of the gods. He stood still for an age, having a strange and wondrous thought. He told Ea, his father, I will have blood all around us. I shall frame it with bone. I shall build a creature. Man shall be his name, said Marduk. Oh, man. You shall serve all the gods. And so it came to pass. The Lord God Marduk spoke it. He let there be man, and thus freed the gods from eternal labor. And that's the end of the story. Mm. So there are lots of elements in this story. A lot of them, and they cross references, but you see them fighting. I mean, you see a struggle between them. Yes, you see a struggle. Uh, yeah. Uh, and if you identify those gods with nature, with elements of nature. Right, because they can each be identified with something in nature. Okay. Now, I know you have talked about mm -hmm. the Egyptian cosmology and their gods, but there is a... Would you like for me to read one of their Yeah, please. As a contrast. Yeah, might as, yeah as a contrast, you might as well. Because I know someone is going to pull out the one of... Uh, Oh, there's, there's stories within those gods, too, but I'm beginning to think that they were interpreted wrong. Go ahead. Okay. There, first of all, there's not one cosmology from Kemet. There are many, many different stories. Uh, uh, and when I mean different, there are many, there are great differences between them. <laughs> They're not all exactly the same. But I'm going to read from a couple of the older ones. The oldest cosmology that we have so far comes from the pyramid texts. The pyramid texts are the oldest uh, writings with, of a cosmological nature that we have from Kemet. Um, so here are, in chronological order, a couple of the oldest cosmo cosmologies. Autumn came into being in Iyunu. As one who comes extended, he put his penis in his hand that he might achieve orgasm with it, so that the two twins were born, that is, Shu and Tefnut. Here's another one. 
from the pyramid text, uh, uttering 600. Atum Kepper. Atum means complete, Kepper means coming into being. You have come up as the hill, you have arisen as the bindin in the house of the herald in Iluna. You have sneezed as Shu, and you have spit forth as Tethmet. You have put your arms around them as the arms of a Ka, so that your Ka might be in them. O oh, great Enid that is in Iluna, Atum, Shu, Tethmet, Geb, Nut, Usir, Aset, Setesh, Nebethet, children of Atum, extend his heart to his child in your identity of nine bows. And I'd like to read one more, uh, the most famous one. I am the Ba of Shu, the Netaru, the Neta who came into being of himself. It was in the body of the Netar who came into being himself that I came into being. I am the Ba of Shu, the god or Netar mysterious of nature. It was in the body of the Netar mysterious of nature that I came into being. It was in the body of the Netar who came into being himself that I was tied together. I am coterminous with the Netaru who came into being of himself, for I have come into being in him. I am the one who stilled the sky for him. I am the one who calmed the land. I am the one who foretold the coming into being from the horizon. And there's one more that I'm going to read. Um, it's a, from the coffin text. This is from coffin text, utterance number 80. Then Autumn said, Tefnut is my living daughter. She shall be with her brother Shu. His name is Life, her name is Ma'at. It is with my two children, my two fledglings, that I shall live, being in the midst of them, one of them behind me, one of them before me. I'd just like to explain that Shu is air, Tefnut is moisture. It is with my daughter Ma'at that life shall, shall lie, one of them with me, one of them around me. It is on them that I have stood with their arms around me. It is on my son who I have begotten in my name. Who shall live, for he knows how to give life to the one in the ape, or the womb, namely men who come forth from my eye, which I set when I which I set when I was alone, with new in a state of inertness, before I had found a place that I could stand upon or sit down on, before Iunu, in which I exist, had been founded before the planet that had been tied together, that I might sit on it, before I made Newt so that she might be above my head and create Geb, before the first corporation had been born, before the primeval Enid had come into being so that they might be with me. Then Autumn said to Nu, I am floating with a very I'm very weary. Mankind is inert. It is my son, Life, who shall lift up my heart. He will give life to my heart when he has brought together these weary members of mine. I am Shu to whom Atom gave birth the breezes of life from my clothing. They came forth behind me from the mouth of Atom, who precedes the breezes along my path. I am he, Atom, who, cre who cre Atom created. I am bound from my place of eternity. It is I, I who am perpetuity, who gives birth to millions, who continues the spitting of Atom that came forth from his mouth when he used his hand to let this desire fall to the ground. So these are a couple of versions of the kinetic cosmology.
Um, but they all speak of a process of coming into being, of life, whether it's through masturbation, through birth, through speaking the word, which is another version that we have, through um, uh, uh, spitting forth of Shu and Tefnut, and in this version, the making of mankind came about through, through his son, life, and through his eye, and through a warm and generous manner. This is very easy to contrast with our Mesopotamian story, which we saw was one of struggle between evil, evil demons. And uh, even the creation of man in our Mesopotamian story was one of, was hostile. Man was created to serve the gods. And then in the end, Marduk said, and now the gods don't have to labor anymore. <laughs> so the cosmological concept is so vastly different, there's no comparison. I could the Miriam version. What I have here are some, is a myth from Sumeria. The, the creation story from Samaria. Um, the translator was uh, Samuel Kramer, and I am reading it from the ancient Near East. Mm -hmm. Our translation of text from the Near East. There are two ver there are two stories I'm going to take from, but the first one, which is um, uh, the story of the deluge, I just want to point out that the gods of the Sumerians and the gods of the old Babylonians were the same. And it says, it gives here in, in our, our story, after, after Anu, Enlil, Inki, and Ninhursam had fashioned the black-headed people, vegetation, lucrative, from the earth, animals, four-legged creatures of the plain, were brought artfully, artfully into existence. And I'm going to leave it there for, for this. Um, but I'm just pointing out that the, the gods are the same as the old Babylonian gods. But I'm going to go over to another version of the story. This is the story that comes from the tale of Gilgamesh, which is a, um, an epic tale from Sumer. And it be, I'm going to start at this point. Udnat Pishtian said to him, to Gilgamesh, I will, re I will reveal to thee, Gilgamesh, a hidden matter, and a secret of the gods I will tell thee. Shurapak, a city which you know, which is on the Euphrates banks, that city was ancient, as were the gods within it. When their hearts led the great gods to produce the flood, they were Anu, their father, Valiant Enlil, their counselor, and Ninutra, their assistant. Enuj, the irrigator, and Inguki, Ia, was also present with them. These were also the, some of the same gods that we heard about in the old Babylonian martyr. Their words he repeated to the reed hut, hut. Reed hut, reed hut, wall, wall. Reed hut, hearken, wall, reflect. Man of Shurapak, son of Ubar Tutu, tear down this house and build a ship. Give up possessions, seek thou life. Forswear worldly goods and keep the soul alive. Aboard the ship and take you the seed of all living things, the ship that you have built, that you shall build, her dimension shall be to measure, equal shall be her width and length, like the Apsu, you shall seal her. I understood and I said to Ea, my lord, behold, my lord, what you have ordered, I will be honored to carry out. But what shall I answer the city, the people, and the elders? Ea opened his mouth to speak, saying to me, his servant, You shall then thus speak unto them. I have learned that Enlil is hostile to me, so I cannot reside in your city, nor set foot in Enlil's territory. 
To the deep I will therefore go down to dwell with my Lord Ea. But upon you he will shower down abundance, the choicest, the choicest birds, the rarest fishes. The land shall have its fill of harvest riches. He who at dusk orders the husk greens will shower down upon you a rain of wheat. With the first glow of dawn, the land was gathered about me. To, um, the little ones carried bitumen, while the grown ones bought all else that was needed. On the fifth day, I laid her framework. One whole acre was her floor space, ten dozen cubits the height of each of her walls, ten dozen cubits each edge of the square deck. I laid out the contours and I joined her together. I provided her with six decks, dividing her into seven parts. Her, four, her floor plan I divided into nine parts. I hammered water plugs into her. I saw to the putty hose and laid in supplies. Six sar measure of bitumen I poured into the furnace. Three sar of asphalt I also poured inside. Three sar of basket bearers carried aside from the one sar of oil which the cracklings consumed, and the two sar of oil which the boatmen stowed away. Bullocks I slaughtered for the people, and I killed, every sh and I killed sheep every day. Must red wine, oil, and white wine, I gave the workmen to drink as though river water, that they might feast on the New Year's Day. I opened ointment, applying it to my hand, on the seventh day, the ship was completed. The launching was very difficult, so that they had to shift the flood planks and below. Whatever I have, I whatever I had, I laid it upon her. Whatever I had of silver, I laid it upon her. Whatever I had of gold, whatever I had of all living things, I laid upon her. All my family and my kin, I may go on the ship. The beasts of the field, the wild creatures of the field. All the craftsmen I may go aboard. Shamash, Shamash is the sun, by the way, had set for me a stated time when he who orders unseas at night will shower down a rain of light. Board thou ship and batten up the interest. That started time had arrived. He who orders unseas at night showers down a rain of blight. I watched the appearance of the weather. The weather was awesome to behold. I boarded the ship and batted up the entrance to batten down the whole ship to Prusa Amui, the boatman. I handed over the structure together with its contents. When the first glow of dawn, a black cloud rose up from the horizon. Inside it, Ahad thunders, while Shulat and Hanish go in front. These are also their names of gods. Moving as heralds over the plain. Iragel tears out the post. Forth comes Ninutra and causes the dikes to follow. Then Anuki lift up the torches, setting the land ablaze with their glare. Concentration over Adad reaches to the heaven, who turned to blackness all that had been light. The wide land was shattered like a pot. For one day the south storm blew, gathering speed as it blew, submerging the mountains, overtaking the people like a battle. No one can see his fellow, no one can the people be recognized from heaven. The gods were frightened by the deluge, and shrinking back, they ascended to the heaven of Anu. The gods, even cowered like dogs, crouched against the outer wall. Ishtar cried out like a woman in travail, Ishtar is a god. The sweet voice mistress of the gods moans aloud. The olden days are all turned to clay. Because I spoke evil in the assembly of gods, how could I bespeak evil in the assembly, evil in the assembly of the gods, ordering battle for the destruction of my people? And it goes on, I'm not gonna finish it, but, um, this blood story is directly comparable to the first story in Genesis, even to the, even to the building of the ark itself. 
And it ends the same way too, with the dove, the landing on the, on the hill, um, the name of which escapes, escapes me at the moment. Uh, it is exactly the same as the flood story in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And here we have the gods destroying mankind uh, for whatever they have done and saving this one person um, and his family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this story comes from Sumeria, which comes from the people of the Old Testament, and that's where we come. Mm -hmm. Just, if you could give us just a couple of examples of how they appease the gods, the kind of pacts they make for their sacrifice. I mean, you can use Abraham with his son if you want to, but mm -hmm. was this widespread? Um, and did they do any of the kind of pacts in Egyptian cosmology? I knew they, they made um, offerings to the gods, but what was the difference between their offerings and the offerings in which uh, mm -hmm. came out of Babylonia and those areas? Right. Uh, and tie in cannibalism if you can. Well, we can use Abraham um, sacrificing his son mm -hmm. and a human sacrifice um, as one example. We don't find there are no human sacrifices in Kemet. The millions of pictures and reliefs that you've seen in Kemet, you've never seen a human sacrifice. You've, as a matter of fact, sacrifice is perhaps not a fair word or the right word that we're using. Um, because sacrifice is giving up one thing for another. But an offering is not giving up one thing for another. An offering is, is an act of reciprocity. It's giving something back, giving something in return. Even, even the one example that I gave of sacrificing the bull to ward off death is not a... It's, that, that is really more a sacrifice of an animal, exchanging, exchanging the life of the bull for death, or for death itself. Um, but the offerings that are depicted all over Kemon and all the walls and the temples, those are offerings, those are not sacrifices. But in, among the Jews, we do, the, we do have the concept of sacrifice, exchange one life for another life. So those are two very different things, and I guess you'd have to really say that in, in Kemet, sacrifice is very, what we call sacrifice, is very, very limited. As we know so far, only to that one thing I mentioned. Um, I did my master's paper on, sacri on, on uh, animal sacrifice in Kemet, comparing it to um, animal sacrifice in, in the other East African cattle cultures, and um, that is the only, um, the only use or purpose of sacrifice in Kenya that we have. The offerings are something, that's something very different, that's not sacrifice. Yes, uh, I, I just like to know for my own personal mm -hmm. reason, um, the, the, the killing of goats and chickens mm -hmm. and the kinds of things that go on now in West Africa right. um, and East Africa. Are they in any way derivative out of Egypt? Uh, is that the same kind of sacrifice and not offering, or would you consider it offering? Right, that's a very good question. I would say that a lot of what you have in Africa today in terms of sacrifice is not derived out of Kemet. And it is derived out of the historical process um, of losing of one lo loss of the meaning of, of offerings in Kemet, loss of the, the meaning of the old traditions and the old customs that, that we have in Kemet, also influenced by Christianity, Judaism, and Islam in Africa, and influenced by, by Western thought period, whether it was, whether it was the Persians or the, um, the Romans or the Christians or whoever it was, but um, influenced by other than ancient African traditions for sacrifice, because a lot of sacrifice today in Africa is an exchange of a life for something else. It doesn't have to be the exchange of a life for a life. It could be the exchange of a life for, for anything that you want. For example, if you wanted to, um, to marry a certain person and you wanted to win that person's love, you might be asked to bring 
uh, the, the priest or priestess might sacrifice for you a chicken or a guinea fowl or, or a goat, an animal. It might take, he or she might take the life of that living thing in exchange for your desires. That is very commonplace in Africa today. Sacrifices, in other words, taking the life in exchange for something else, whether it is a desire or a wish on a person's part, um, is or uh, it could it could be good things. It could be like safe travel to some place, or or to come back home from from war, or just anything. But the whole idea of taking a life in exchange for something that a, that a person desires does not exist in Kenya at all that we can find. It has never been written about, never, and, and nothing that we have written left to us in writing. Nowhere can you find such an act being done. Then I have to uh, ask a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the culture of Egypt, was it African? Was it different? Are, are we talking about the same black people in Ethiopia, Egypt, uh, West Africa, so forth? Yeah, I, we are talking about the same African people. Uh, but before I get, before I kind of uh, uh, talk about that a little bit, I just wanted to just go back to my previous statement mm -hmm. about taking a life for an exchange for a wish or desire. Mm -hmm. um, in Kemet, as we've talked about before, and I talked about in previous discussions that we've had, the sacredity of life, uh, the belief that all life sustains life, and the belief that everything is netu. Um, given, given the whole concept of netu and, and life and the sacredness of all life that the kinetic people had, in that kind of, in that context, it would be hard to put into that context the taking of life, the destroying, destruction of life, for, for a wish or a desire. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to comprehend, given the context of comedic thought. Even if it was the life of a bull, a goat, a chicken? But a bull and a goat and a chicken, that is as sacred as the life of a man or a tree or a river or a star. In Kemet, everything is natural. All life is sacred. All life sustains life. All life is necessary. It's, it's necessary for the growth and healthy, the healthy growth and development of all life in order for everything to exist in a peaceful and harmonious balance. That is what Ma'at is. That's what Ma'at is. So destroying life, unless it's, unless it's to ward off evil, is it, fairly incomprehensible in Kemet. When you look at the cattle cultures, the so-called cattle cultures, the Dinka, the Shoa, the Nuru people who live in East Africa, you can see that animals are very precious to them, especially cows. I mean, they wouldn't kill, they do not kill cows. Cows are like their family, their friends. The only time Cows, when they get old, they die. They, they have names, they live in the houses with people, they do not kill them for any sacrificial purpose. And that, that is the culture that, those are the, the cattle cultures are the cultures I compared with the um, cattle sacrifices in Kemet. Because in those cultures, they do, um, they, they never kill, they never kill the, the animals at all. But I've seen all over the walls of Kemet bulls and fish and chickens and everything that they are, have slaughtered them. They are piled up right. for, um, for an offering. For an offering. It's for an offering for the ancestors. But I think once again, what I'm trying is what I'm trying to d distinguish is between sacrifice and offering, reciprocity, um, and between reciprocity and sacrifice. There's a big difference. I mean, they ate them, didn't they? Didn't they eat chickens yes. and ducks? And Absolutely. 
The Camites ate meat, they ate chick, they ate all, they ate animals. Then, I mean, but then they killed. But it's sustenance. It has to do with what I was saying before, that all life sustains life. Mm -hmm. That food, that certain mm -hmm. animals were sustenance for human beings. Just like certain animals are sustenance for other animals. Lions kill kill deer and pigs and, and you know, they bring down zebra and they devour them. That is their sustenance. That is sustenance for their, for their bodies, for their, for their life, for their continued existence. So in a society where meat is, continued, is considered sustenance of life, is what you have in Kemet. But that is totally different than sacrifice, than taking a life for a wish or desire. Where, where does cannibalism come in? I mean, uh, Europeans have accused Africans of being cannibalistic. Uh, were Africans in, in, in the cosmology anywhere else? When, how, does, how do they get involved in cannibalism? And were Europeans, by the same token, cannibalistic? Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know whether the Europeans were cannibals or not, <laughs> so I, I really couldn't justly say, say so. Mm -hmm. But I, I do know that the Kemites were not. And by, if you mean by cannibalism, the eating or consuming of, of human flesh, yes. nowhere in any, on any relief that you've ever seen in Kemet, <laughs> and you've seen them all, have you ever seen human sacrifice or cannibalism occurring. And nowhere in any text that we have from ancient Kemet have we ever heard of it or read of it as well. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the Europeans, and I'd like to give you a really good example of how they interpret certain things um, and how, some, how a worldview has um, uh, great bearing on how we read an ancient text. And this one has to do with cannibalism. Okay. Right, I'd like to read um, another passage from the pyramid text, Utterance 273 and 274, which many translators have called or t entitled the Cannibal Hymn. It's called, uh, well, We'll, we'll start at the beginning. The sky rains, stars darken, the vaults quiver, earth's bones tremble, the planets stand still, at seeing Unus rise as power. I just want to, I have to say at the beginning that Unus is a deceased person and he's on his way to the next life. He's, oh, yes. he's on his way to the next stage of life. And uh, this is a process that he is going through to attain the stage of the op. So this all takes place in the cosmos. Unus is a netter, is, is a netter who lives on his fathers, who feeds on his mothers. Unus is master of cunning whose mother knows not his name. Unus is glorious in Nut. His power is in the light land. Like Atum, his father, his begetter, though his son, he is stronger than he. The forces of Unus are behind him. His helpers are under his feet. His netaru are on his head. His serpents are on his brow. Unus' his lead serpent is on his brow. Soul searcher whose brain consumes. Unus' his neck is in its place. Unus is the bull of heaven, who rages in his heart, who lives on the being of every netter, who eats their entrails. When they come, their bodies are full of heka from the Isle of Flame. Unus is one equipped who has gathered his spirits. Unus has risen as great one, as master of servants. He will sit with his back to Geb, Geb is the earth. Unus will judge with him whose name is hidden on the day of slaying the eldest. Unus is lord of the offerings who knots the cord, who himself prepares his meal. Unus is he who eats men 
feeds on Netaru, master of messengers who sends instructions. It is Horn, Grasper, and Kekau who lassos them for Unis. It is serpent raised head who guards, who holds them for Unis. It is he upon the willows who binds them for him. It is Konus, slayer of the Neb, who cuts their throats for Unis, who tears their entrails out for him. He who, he the envoy who is sent to punish. It is Shimshu who carves them up for Unis, cooks meals of them for him in his dinner pots. Unis eats their heka, swallows their spirits. Their big ones are for his morning meal, their middle ones for his evening meal, the little ones are for his night meal, and the oldest males and females for his fuel. The great ones in the northern sky light him fire for their kettles, contents with the old ones' thighs, for the sky dwellers serve Unis, and the pots are scraped for him with their women's legs. He has encompassed the two skies. He has circled the two shores. Unis is the great power that overpowers the powers. Unis is the divine hawk, the great hawk of hawks. Whom he finds on his way, he devours whole. Unis is places before all the nobles in light man. Unis is Neter, oldest of the old. Thousands serve him, hundreds offer to him. Great power rank was given him by Orion the father of the Netaru. Unis has risen again in heaven, in the sky. He is crowned as the Neb of the light land. He has smashed bones and marrow. He has seized the hearts of the Netaru. He has eaten the red, swallowed the green. Unis feeds on the lungs of the wise, likes to live on hearts and their heka. Unis abhors licking the coils of the red, but delights to have their heka in his belly. I'll stop there. Mm. But what Unis is doing, um, it's symbolism. And the symbolism is that he is devouring the Netaru, um, that he is devouring their spirits, that he is devouring, he is devouring everything that they have into himself. Yeah, but isn't Unis uh, an Egyptian god? No, Unis is a person, a real person who passed away. Unus is an actual, he was a Nasu Bidi. He was a, he was a living human being. Well, why and this I... ritual is for him to, um, to envelop or to envelop or to imbibe all, everything that is in the cosmos. Oh, so he That's what's be... being named to yeah. He will become one with all that's in the cosmos. Yes. Uh, okay. All right. Um, you were going to give us some examples of those uh, 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 packs that were made. Um, maybe you did. Uh, that the uh, uh, the ancient. Uh, yeah, they have sacrifices for various reasons, you know. Mm -hmm. For very, but this is. You want to just read this one example, sure. and uh, it's an example of a burnt sacrifice. Oh. Okay. <laughs> So an example from a burnt sacrifice, uh, from Numbers, from the Bible, the book of Numbers uh, 19. This is after the Israelites uh, came out of bondage um, and were settled in their new land. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and unto, and unto Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring thee a red heifer without spot, wherein there is no blemish, and upon which uh, never came yoke. And ye shall give her to Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his face. And Eleazar the priest shall take of her blood with his finger, and sprinkle of her blood directly over the tabernacle, of the congregation seven, seven times. And one shall burn the heifer in his sight with skin and her flesh and her blood, with her dung, 
shall he burn. And the priest shall take cedar wood and hyssop and scarlet and cast it into the midst of the burning of the heifer. Then the priest shall wash his clothes and he shall bathe his flesh in water and afterwards he shall come into the camp and the priest shall be unclean until the evening. And he that burneth her shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in water and, should be, and shall be unclean until the evening. And a man that is clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them up without the camp in a clean place, and it shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel. For a water of separation, it is a purification for sin. Sacrifices were often done among the Israelites for purification from sin. But the best place to get examples of sacrifices is the Talmud. And so one day we'll have to look at it. Let's see if we can uh, look at uh, some of the comparisons that many make uh, with uh, uh, the Egyptians' the concepts of uh, uh, us and Jesus. But just as you segue into that, perhaps you'll look at the difference uh, uh, comparing uh, of whether the Egyptians were monotheistic or polytheistic, and then let's move into outside. Mon monotheism and polytheism are words created by European intellectuals. As I have suggested before, that the idea of one God derived or developed in Mesopotamia, more than likely among the Old Babylonians during the time of Hammurabi and their elevation of Martin to one God for political reasons. Mm -hmm. That was monotheism, placing one God above all the other gods to be praised. Monotheism is the belief in one God. And the use of that term politically is, of course, very powerful. The whole idea of one ruler as a matter of fact, Marta refers to himself as the ruler of ruler, the lord of lords, the king of kings. He refers to himself as that. So politically, that's a very powerful notion. Monotheism is a very powerful notion. One entity under which all mankind is subjugated. The thing is, with the Mesopotamians, the one god under which all mankind was to be subjugated was their god, their entity. With uh, their cultural determinations to him, even the fact that it's a him that was chosen. Um, it's a very powerful concept. And they gave the idea, they gave the term polytheism, meaning poly, more than one God, uh, as, another, as another comparative term, which is considered in the Western world to be less civilized than having one God. But they're just terms, and they really don't mean anything other than in the context of, what, of, of the Western world and their world view mm -hmm. of their one rule and their one power concept uh, from which their one God to, to rise. Polytheism, the belief in more than one God, has been designated to people who don't have the, that one God concept. Um, but many of the people that are termed and religions that are termed polytheistic are not beliefs in many gods in the sense of, of gods that the Mesopotamians, the sense of the god or gods that the Mesopotamians understand. For example, they could argue that the Native Americans are polytheistic because they believe in spirits of different uh, nature spirits. Is that the same as belief in one, is, in belief in gods? Is, is that the same as a, as, as a belief in many gods? Among the Mesopotamians themselves, before the advent of Marduk, we had, as we saw on, I think it was Enlil, Ia, mm -hmm. Aduki, Minturu, uh, Inki, and Apsu, and just many, 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 quote, gods, we had a pantheon of, of gods in Mesopotamia itself. Um, or 
you could argue a pantheon of, 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 of elements or spiritual beings or, or whatever um, in Mesopotamia itself. Uh, we also have heard the word henotheism. I'm not really sure what that means <laughs> anymore. But there are all these kinds of terms that are centered around this belief in God. But first of all, you have to have a God concept, I think, to be monotheistic or poly polytheistic, or, or to, to, class, to be classified in that terminology. They called the Kimites polytheists. And uh, the Europeans used to write that they became monotheist under Akhenaten, that uh, the old literature written by the Europeans on Kemet used to proclaim that it was Akhenaten who elevated Aten to the position of the highest god, right. or as a god and above and beyond all the others. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of monotheism in Kemet. Um, it's very un, unrighteous and unfair to to suggest that because first of all, even Agnaten at all times during his life acknowledged the existence of all of the other Netaru. And yes, he did appear to elevate Aten as supreme over the others. But if we look at the 18th dynasty, the period in which Agnaten lived and the tremendous Asiatic Mesopotamian influence in his royal court, in his family, um, in his city, we can perhaps begin to understand where he himself got the idea of elevating one, one element to be above and beyond all, all others. Uh, as a matter of fact, the second millennium, that is the same millennium that in which we find the old Babylonian empire and the elevation of martyrs. Um, plus, it has been suggested by many scholars, both Western and African, that his wife, Nefertiti, was not an African Kemite, but she too was born uh, perhaps from a place called Mitanni in Mesopotamia. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, she too could have had a great deal of influence on his spiritual beliefs. But the whole idea of elevating one element above all others to be praised and worshipped. Doesn't that sound a lot like what was going on in Mesopotamia? And not at all like what was happening in Kemet. After all, the Kemites never, never, never had that kind of concept. The Kemites had a, had a system where um, they believed in the Netaru. That the Netaru, first of all, or everything that exists is a Netaru, Netar or a Netaru. Mm -hmm. But certain ones that were involved in creation, the elements that were involved in creation, were given special names. And certain ones, certain elements and concepts that were significant in the lives of men and women were given certain names and certain symbols. Mm -hmm. Those are not gods. The Netaru were not gods. They were, they were concepts and principles. Mm -hmm. Then let's... Uh... Let's compare um, some of the deities or some of the uh, deities in Christianity with the Neturu um, to see how they differ because many people have compared Jesus with Osiris. Also, Os Os Usir. Usir or Asar. Asar. Okay. Pronunciation can be anything. But before I answer that question, I'd just like to, to make another point, and that is that there are also scholars who say, who like to point to the fact that because the, who believe, let me say this, that the net, that Netta is the totality of all existence and the Netaru are the manifestations of that existence, so that we are all one being and one essence and one nature, and that we all come from the one and we're all part of the one. And people, I've often heard people say, well, isn't that monotheism? that that itself is the most glaring example of monotheism. But I object to that because, number one, there is absolutely no reason on this earth to use the term monotheism when applied to African people. That Western terminology are definitions of their own reality, and we need definitions of our own reality. 
And the God concept of the Europeans is not the same God concept as Neteru, which is, a, which is a non-God concept in itself. And so to apply terminology or definitions that refer to a God concept in Kemet makes absolutely no sense. That they have defined their world in their own terms, and those terms belong to, to their worldview but it does not belong to Africa, and it does not belong to Kenya. So there's no reason for anyone to think that monotheism is so much more profound or great than, than polytheism or henotheism or, or any of the other theisms. Uh, that's a conversation that we don't need to be involved in as African people because it's not about our reality. Then the Africans did not have, quote, gods. No, they didn't have gods. The Kemites didn't have gods. The, Kem the Kemites conceived of concepts and principles that were involved in creation and that related specifically to man. Oh, that's quite different. It's quite different. It's that totally is, different. Oh, wow. Okay. For example, Amen is that which is hidden and unknown. It means hidden, to be hidden and unknown. Atum, completeness, wholeness. Um, Atom, which I read in the uh, cosmology earlier, in the oldest, oldest cosmology, is at the top of the cosmology. Completeness, wholeness. It's a verb in the language, meaning to be complete and to be whole. Shu and Tetmet are the principles of moisture and, and, and air and atmosphere. And Geb is land and, and Newt is the sky or the cosmos. Um, Usir is that which comes into being, excuse me, is that which is renewed and reborn. Kepper is that is the process of coming into being. Aset are the principles of motherhood. All of these things have been called gods. As a matter of fact, Wallace Budge had a book called The Gods of the Egyptians. These are not gods. These are principles. These are netaru. Everything is netter. I'm a netter. You are a netter. This, the wood of this chair is a netter. The metal of this microphone is a netter. The, the, the river hoppy is a netter. The star so petted is a netter. The galaxy is a netter. Everything that exists is one. It's living, it's alive. Africans believe that everything is alive, that there is no animate and inanimate things. So everything is animate, that is life. And that all life sustains them. That's what they believe in. And, uh, that's not a God concept. Just, just if you, if you would, how does a God concept shape your thinking as opposed to what Africa? What difference does, does it, it bring into your does it consciousness? Bring into your consciousness. That is a wonderful question because it, it makes a whole lot of difference actually. If people Let's, let's look at how the Kemites believe first. If they, they believe that everything was natural, that everything was sustenance for everything else, that everything else was sacred. And therefore, they carried, they acted, their life was then focused on or centered on life. Because life, natural, natural are all living things. So they focused themselves on their relationships with one another, on their relationships with nature. They, it's what I call, they had what I call a life-centered life. They lived their lives then to maintain the, to maintain the harmonious balance between every living thing. That was the purpose and the goal of their lives. And they, they lived and did everything in their everyday life to, to bring about that healthy harmony and harmonious balance and and continued growth of everything that exists. As opposed to a God. In order to live by Ma'at, people had to treat their brothers and their sisters right and their neighbors. They had to treat all people right because they were focused on the healthy, happy, growing existence of everybody else because they felt it depend their, their own growth and development dependent on everybody else's. And they were they they consciously paid attention to how they treated nature. 
to to how they planted trees are not polluted for water or how, how they treated nature as well. Because in order for their own life to be to exist in a healthy, growing way, all of nature had to exist in a healthy growing way. That that's how they believed it or conceived it. Whereas if you have a God concept as you did in Mesopotamia and in the Western world, your focus is not on life. Your focus is on God. And God, for the Mesopotamians anyway, was was an entity, a supreme being, who had rule over man and who had control of man's life. We saw that Marduk created man in the story anyway, for man to serve, to serve the gods, as Marduk said. And then he said in the end that the gods will no longer have to labor because man will do it for us. Their, their concept, their focus was on a supreme being whom they had to, whom they had to do certain things for. They had to praise, they had to do rituals, they had to do sacrifices, they had to they had to follow his laws, whatever laws were written in the Talmud or the or whatever holy book of the people might have had. Um, they were totally focused on on doing what the church or the organized institution headed by the supreme being God had commanded them to do. And their focus was not on life, but their focus was on God. So it's a God-centered life rather than a life-centered life. And what does that bring about? That brings that takes away or doesn't doesn't demand the responsibility to how you treat your neighbor, how you treat your friends, how you treat other people. It doesn't demand any responsibility towards how you treat nature. It's all right then to pollute the water and cut down all the trees on the planet Earth. It's all right then to to develop things to break down the ozone layer on the planet Earth. It's all right then to create a bomb and kill thousands of people. It's all right to do that then because your, 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 your obligation is not to life. Your obligation is to God. And as long as you're praising the supreme being, which is always abstracted from man, so long as you're doing that, you're doing everything that's required of you. It takes your focus away from life, and it puts your focus on, on a God concept. And that is why the world is the way it is today, because of, of the because of the, the the massive gathering of people who have been forced, or 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 um, most of the time forced, but um, collected together to put their focus on this European Western God concept and has been re and removed itself from life, from the life-centered life that African people have always known. It's a very destructive thing. It is destroying the planet, it is destroying our sense of self, it is destroying it is destroying our humanity, because it's not about humanity, it's focused on a leader, a supreme being who's abstracted from man who has, in the, as in the Bible, all kinds of controls over us. Like, you, you have to keep the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You, you, have to follow, you, have to, you have to follow the Ten Commandments, the main one of, of which is, you shall not have any other God before me. You, you have all these rules and things that you have to do within, within the context of the church or the religious or, uh, institution uh, whether it's Catholicism or Protestantism or whatever, um, you, you're bound by that. But you don't sit down and you you don't sit down and, and pray or you, you sit down and pray to a God. You spend a lot of time in prayer. Mm -hmm. You you spend a lot of time reciting the Rosary or in church praying to God to give you things, mm -hmm. to make sure certain things don't happen to you, to abstractly save the world or whatever you're praying for um you're, you're praying to god but in africa people and in kemet people weren't in a temple praying to a god they were out in the community making sure that their neighbors had had that the hungry man had food 
that the man didn't have a boat, got a boat, that the widow was taken care of, and the orphan had a father, and the man who didn't have any clothes was given clothes. That is what they were out doing. They weren't in the temple praying God to do, to do this for them, but they were out doing it themselves because in a life-centered life, you are responsible for helping to maintain the harmonious balance of life. You are responsible, not God. Let me ask you two questions then, following that. Mm -hmm. Then what did they do in the temple? What were the temples for? Um, and, um, you know, just looking at Jesus, he also said, uh, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I love the Lord thy God with all the heart and mind. So, but thy neighbor as thyself. Which is the same thing that if you love. But let's deal with what they did in the temples, and then we're going to segue into Jesus and then compare him with Messiah. And we'll, we'll talk about that part of Jesus when we get to okay. the comparison. Okay. What did they do in the temples? Um, in the temples, uh, most of the temples were um, donated or delegated, dedicated, I'll use that word, it's a better word, to the natural not to one specific Neturu, but to whatever the Neturu was, and people had a choice. The choice was usually dependent upon what area of Kemet they lived in, and what time or time period they lived in. Um, because you could have temples to Ma'at, you could have a temple to Aset, you could have a temple to Heru, you could have a temple to Ra, or you could have a temple to Amun. So the Neturu to whom the temple was dedicated didn't make any difference. Um, what was done in the temple was the, the concepts of the principle represented by the Netan rule were studied and perpetuated among the community, were taught among, among the community, the surrounding community and the priest. The people who went in the temple seek to master the concept or seek to master the principle. For example, the temple of Ma'at that's very powerful because Ma'ad is, is one of the most significant concepts in Kemet, or perhaps that the world has ever known. And in a lifetime, you could not learn all there is to know about Ma'ad. But in a temple, it's a place where you would go and contemplate it, where you would go and study it. Mm -hmm. With other people. With other people. But they didn't have priests who, whose job it was to only be priests or priestesses of Ma'ad. The people in the temple rotated their duties. Mo the majority of priests that we know of from Kemet, we have seen, or we can trace back, that they also, besides serving their time in their temple, had, husband, had husbands or wives at home, held jobs in, in the community or responsibilities in the town, and that the temple service was a rotating one, where you would serve maybe two months or three months, and then you'd go home and you'd be a regular person. And we used to talk about that a little while, a long time ago, about how being a regular person is an absolute necessity for being, for understanding whatever natural rule you are, you, are, you are contemplating or studying, the whole idea of being a whole person, always being a whole person, is the only way that you can really be in contact with reality with life and what life is all about. The priest in the Christian church their, their sole duty is to serve God, is to serve God, that's it. Even though before they became priests, they had a normal life, but once they become priests, they give up the world, they give up their normal life, and their whole purpose focus is only on serving God in various ways. And uh, so that they're no longer the whole person. They're, they, uh, what shall I call it? Um, They've relegated their life to, to, to one single thing, and they are out of touch in, in a lot of ways. Then from there on, from that point on, with reality. Let's, let's compare so that we get even a better view. Uh, looking at, say, Christianity and, uh, and uh, the Kemetitan uh, paradigm, Let's look at Jesus and Asar. Mm -hmm. Jesus and Asar. Uh, is there any real comparison before, between them? Well, it is said that uh, that the Trinity of Father, Son, and Holy comes out of the, the you know, Isis, um, Asar, and Haru. Um, 
concept. So let's let's look at it and see if there's any relationship there. Okay. Well, the Trinity, the Trinity concept cannot is not comparable with the Trinity concept of Christianity because in Christianity it is the Father, it is the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's the Trinity of Christianity, as laid down in the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon and Athens. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Trinity that some people suggest in Kemet is Mary, uh, is uh, excuse me, Usir, Hemru, and Aset. We have we have um, three different principles. You couldn't, even if you wanted to consider them to be the father, the mother, and the son, even if you hypothetically wanted to do that, Usia the father, Heru the son, and Aset the mother, there is no comparison that you can make between the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost as a trinity. Um, in terms of, of Usir and Jesus, or, and also Heru and Jesus. Let, let us look at that. Usir is a concept of renewal, rebirth, and rejuvenation. In other words, when we, when we die, we become, we immediately, automatically become Usir. It is, Usir is kind of like the negation of life, a death, excuse me, the negation of death. Because you basically, when we die, and we always use that term in the Western world, we are reborn again renewed again. And the pyramid text, the coffin text, and all of those rituals was about the renewal of life after death. Jesus died on a, on a cross, was crucified to, to relieve man or save man for the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. That's why he was crucified on the cross. To um, Tell us a little bit about the first tower. How and why uh, the first tower was made. Okay, uh, the ancient African people of the Nile Valley produced the very first calendar known to the world, which was based upon solar phenomena. And perhaps they developed the calendar about 6,000 years ago, if not earlier. Uh, the reason for one of the reasons, or perhaps the main reason for the invention of the calendar was to, uh, to be able to regulate the agricultural life of their country, upon which really life in the Nile Valley depended upon the river and, and the agricultural system there. So they developed uh, a calendar which would help them to order, control, and regulate the inundation season, the planting, and the time for the harvest, which enabled them to be one of the main, main food producers in <coughs> the Near Eastern area, which other countries depended upon also for, for, the, for the sustenance of their life and, and food production. We are now, uh, I'm sorry, okay. You know, there might be something uh, important that should be added to that. The, um, the reason why the solar calendar yeah, in terms of answering your question, it's so important is that it's tied to the tropical cycle, that is, food production. Because most early peoples had a lunar calendar, which is a calendar just as well, but it doesn't fit the, the cycle of food. So that's why that solar calendar takes up such a major importance, and that's really what makes them, their calendar so immensely important. And the fact that it fits the food cycle. 
Could, could you um, express that, uh, simplify a little more for us? Sure. Um, by the food cycle, we mean, uh, let's say if you're a farmer, you don't want to plant when it snows on the ground because it will kill your crops. I, mean, I don't know that much about farming, but uh, I know that. And before people had a calendar, they had to guess when it was time to plant, when it was time to harvest, and so forth. But once they got that system under control and they realized that it occurred a certain time, every time, that helped them to develop the calendar. In other words, when the river overflowed, that's time to let the land get water. Okay? And then several cycles later, it was time to plant. And then several cycles, cycles later, it was time to harvest. So that was why, that's what you mean by the tropical cycle. Tropical not really meaning over pertaining to tropics, but it's just a name that's given to the food cycle. Mm -hmm. you know, and this we have no control over there. The solar system itself controls that. Mm -hmm. So that's basically why that calendar is so important and what you mean by the tropical cycle. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at uh, right now um, a film that we did while we were at the Temple of um, Combo, I think. And there is the Nile system. Can you explain that Nile system to us? The Nile system? Or the Nile meter? The Nile meter. Okay, the Nile meter. The Nile meter was a way that the ancient Kemetic people had of measuring how high the river would rise each year so that they would know how to regulate the, how to control and regulate the irrigation system so that they would know uh, as accurately as possible how to how to do the planting for that particular year. So it was a way really of keeping of keeping a measurement of of the, the, the rise of the river each year so that they could uh, control the agricultural system for better production of food. In other words there was a passage at the bottom of that nylon meter? Yes. Actually, it's a big well or a big hole in the ground. Mm -hmm. And it has, uh, it's measured. It's each, gradated. It's gradated. Mm -hmm. um, so that and each year they would mark it where the river rose that particular year is marked. So the record was kept continuously, actually, for thousands of years. Did that have any relationship or uh, input into the development of the calendar? Uh, it's oh, definitely sure. related to it, yes, because one of the things that they did do on the Nile Meadow, uh, they marked the year that, uh, the, well, the year was marked along with the measurement as it was marked. Mm -hmm. it, that, that, that Nile Meadow, that measurement, had a lot to do with determining the first block on the calendar called Shemuk. Mm -hmm. that, that meant the overflow. Oh, okay. Uh, so therefore, when the Nile meter hit a certain gradation, a certain height, they could tell how much the river would overflow. And that also signaled this first season of the calendar called Shemu. Mm -hmm. So they were very scientific about what they were doing. It wasn't guesswork at all. When was the first calendar developed? Well, when you say the first calendar, it was probably more than likely developed by African peoples. But this solar calendar, most historians have an argument about that, and um, we sort of agree it's, it's about 6,000 years ago. And, uh, but there's arguments going about about that. Most of the European scholars are arguing. We're convinced. Yeah. We, we know it's at doing. least 6,000 years. Easy. But it's, Easy. Like, as I said before, it could even possibly be much older. Where would that it have developed? Um, in particular, where? What uh, area of Africa? Well, Egypt, or Kemet, what we call Kemet. Mm -hmm. um, the specific locale, that's very hard to paint on. But scientifically speaking, it's almost impossible for this calendar to be anything less than, say, six or 8,000 years. Because developing a calendar is one thing, but to actually put it on paper and have it mathematically measured out, that takes several centuries in order to get a backlog of data to know what to mark, you see. Mm -hmm. So to try to say that it's only 4,000 years old, when the pyramids are older, and it's almost impossible to build a pyramids without the calendar, you see, it has to be dated back much, much, much uh, more. 
and what they would uh, do. Perhaps you can give us uh, some of the science that's going to be necessary then in uh, creating the calendar. What would one actually have to know in terms of the inch, the second? Are these arbitrary measurements? Or how do they? Oh, no. There's nothing arbitrary here at all. Uh, but let me say this first. Firstly, there's a, there's a confusion of terms here. An inch is a linear type of measurement, and time is not uh, a linear measurement. You see, so we'll take the inch out for a moment, and let's talk about the time. Uh, some of the sciences you need to develop a calendar are quite serious. You need to know a great deal about mathematics. There's no question about that. You need to know physics. You need to know astronomy. And you need to know a little bit of geology okay, to develop a calendar. And they had that knowledge down to, well, again, you know, an exact science. They were quite good at it. And one thing the ancient Kenites did that really set them apart was they kept data. You see, they kept data. They didn't just proceed haphazardly. They had reams and reams of data, you see. So, and the reason why you need all this science is because the solar calendar is based on the phenomena of the Earth rotating about, excuse me, revolving about the sun. So automatically you're talking the solar system. Okay. That's the basis of our year. The period, which is what you mean by the length of time it takes to go around once, is uh, 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 45.44 uh, seconds. So that's the origin of the year. At that time, they didn't have a name for it, but they meant one full cycle. You see. So you had to know astronomy, you had to know mathematics, and you had to know a little bit of geology. What, what would be involved in, in the type of astronomy that they would need to know at that time? Well, when you say the type of astronomy, that's a little bit difficult. Astronomy, you know, it's astronomy. Uh, but you would have to have an accurate charting of planets. You would have to know positions. Right? And again, that comes back to that idea of the data-taking ability that they had, which was astounding. Because you have, to, you have to remember, they didn't have all the sophisticated astronomical instruments we have today. You know, in fact, they had to invent quite a lot of them. So charting of planets is absolutely paramount. You must know the position of the planets. And then there was something else that's Extremely important I have to point out to you. This idea of leap year. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is you're trying to keep the calendar accurate relative to the length of the full cycle. But a calendar, if you notice, only has full days in it. It doesn't have partial days, hours and seconds, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. They were the first to realize that the calendar was really too short. So they realized every four years the calendar seemed to lose a day. So they recognized that they had to put that day back every four years. That's the origin of the leap year. You see, so they could not have gotten that information had they not been taking serious data regularly and well. You see, mm -hmm. and in fact, this idea of the leap year is in, is, uh, is literally etched in stone on a, on a stone called the Canopus Stone, which uh, we can tell you a great deal about. Mm -hmm. But this is proof of the fact that they knew it needed an adjustment. Uh, I think she can give you a little more about the uh, Canopus Stone. And I just want to add something too about the Canaanites and astronomy. The very some of the very earliest calendars that you see on the temple walls include not only the yearly cycle, but several astronomical cycles, as well as the rising the recording of the rising and setting of, of, of certain stars. So that's a part of the calendar itself, often mm -hmm. But it, Okay, well, I was just going to say something too about the uh, Canobis stone, mm -hmm. where the uh, Canaanites proclaim that the year uh, is actually a little bit, is more than 365 days, and they institute the concept of the leap year to be observed in the internet. And that's the first known recording of the leap year. Now, where is that recording? Well, that is no longer in a temple. The stone has been taken to a museum uh, in Europe, I think, in the British Museum. Okay. Um, in terms of science again, I want to follow it up, uh, particularly because so many of our young people um, have problems with math. Um, and you're telling me that their ancestors, the Africans, created math 
You're going to tell me a little bit about the inch. You took that out and separated that. Uh, oh, yeah. So can you can you get back to that? Uh, sure. Um, there's no question that that our ancient African, ancient African ancestors invented mathematics. Now, the Chemites didn't use the concept called an inch. They used something called it was a subdivision of a fathom, and they're calling it the pyramid inch. Now this pyramid inch is about as big as what we call the inch, but our inch is the English inch from the English system. And that came from, believe it or not, the human anatomy. For instance, if you take your finger and you do it like this, that distance from this knuckle to that knuckle, it was on the king's hand, they would consider that to be an inch. But now a problem resulted from that. When the next king was born, if his fingers were shorter or longer, then your inch changed. So your standard of variation simply was not the same. You can't maintain a civilization with variable measurement system. Mm -hmm. An inch has to be an inch and it must be the same inch because you lie and everyone else, you see. Mm -hmm. So standardization was important and the Egyptians knew that. So they standardized all their units and they had a thing called the royal cubit. And subdivisions of that, there is something that's close to an inch. Okay? And it's actually literally etched on black granite so it doesn't vary. Now let me, let me say this to you. Thousands of years later, I mean, approximately 5,000, 6,000 years later, so-called Western civilization, modern civilization, copied the exact same idea of trying to maintain what you mean by a fixed standard length. As severe as France, I'm not certain if I'm pronouncing it correctly because I don't speak French that well, but as severe as France, there's um, an international bar that's kept of flattening uridium, and it's at a certain temperature, and there's a mark etched on it. And that mark is uh, something like an inch. Then they have another one with a centimeter mark on it. And the reason why it's kept at that temperature is to maintain that standard. Now, in the National Bureau of Standards and Weights here in Washington, D.C., in America, they have a similar bar. And they compare these two bars periodically to, to maintain the accuracy. So the reason why you need an inch is because when you're building something, you need subdivisions of length. Let us say you're building something that's a yard long. Well, that's fine. But what if you have to build something that's half that size, or half that size, or half that size? So you need some fine, uh, I guess you would call it graininess of measurement, and that was the inch. But it started out being quite arbitrary. That is to say, the distance between this amount of space. Can you tell us a little bit about the pyramids and their relationship uh, to the caliphate? What uh, does the pyramid include in terms of its complication to build it, what would one need to know to build the pyramids? That's an interesting question. You say a little bit. You could go on at length about the pyramids, you see. Uh, well, here's the essential thing. When we get a look at the calendar, you'll see a picture there, and you'll see them charting the path of a star. The star is going, it's, it's, its ray is going down to the ground, and they're measuring it precisely. At that precise point is where a pyramid would be built. And this star's gaze would go right down into the pyramid and illuminate a little room there. So stars and their, their brilliance help determine positions of pyramids. Now, the Chemites were so bright that they were able to determine the exact cardinal positions of the pyramid, that is to say north, east, south, and west, without using the compass. Because nowhere is a compass found in Egypt. That is to say, in command. So the question becomes, how were they able to define north, east, south, and west? They did it by these objects called oblets, which is uh, Cleopatra's needle and that kind of stuff. And there's a way you can trisect it, and you can get true north from that. And they were able to do that. You see? So, but they weren't just uh, decorations. Everything they built had a purpose. Okay. Now, you cannot build the pyramids without a calendar. Because let's say uh, you get the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Khufu's Pyramid, uh, which is what we call the Great Pyramid. Uh, European books would call it Cheops Pyramid, but we call it Khufu's Pyramid because it's after Pharaoh Khufu, and that was that was his name. Mm -hmm. um, when you attempt to build that pyramid, you need thousands of people. Well, how can you call all these people together at the same time simultaneously if you don't know what time it is? Mm -hmm. See. So the calendar regulated time, that is to say when the work crew should be there, the calendar regulated cooking because when you're trying to cook for 
10, 15,000 people at one time, you see. You must have this thing efficiently under control. Who's cooking the vegetables, who's cooking the meat, who has the, 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 the wine and so forth. That has to be all organized. It's, imagine a, a gigantic catering party, if you will. Right? So the calendar had to regulate that. Also, some of the granite stones that they used on these pyramids, some weigh as much as five tons. And the granary was several miles you know, away. So the only way they could get it, and not the only way, but one of the ways they did it was by going along the river. But the river had to overflow enough such that they could float on barges and get the stones there. So when does the river overflow? The calendar tells you. Mm -hmm. so, so everything, the whole life cycle is centered around that calendar. You see? Mm -hmm. So, and the pyramids, it's really, I don't know, kind of like an unfair question to ask because it's so enormous in its mathematical and scientific complexity that you really couldn't cover it in, in, in a, in a two-hour show. Or two, you, know, like that. Mm -hmm. it, it, you could go on at length about those pyramids which I have done, I've studied it extensively, and it's, it's, it's really quite superb in the, in the method, and in the mathematics that's in there. There's no question about it. Well, I definitely want to do a whole program around just the pyramids. Um, but we're looking, uh, again, uh, here at the uh, Temple of Jindra, we're looking at uh, that zodiac. Uh, how does that zodiac, in particular, relate to the calendar that they the uh, Kemet people of ancient times. Just to uh, to go back for a moment uh, to what I said before about the ancient calendars having uh, as part of the, the whole calendar the constellations and stars and the time of the rising and setting of stars, etc. Um, but at Denver, what we see is a, a group of constellations of stars as defined by the ancient Kemetic people. In other words, it's like a star, a, a star chart or a star map with the various constellations presented. At Denver, a temple which was built during the Ptolemaic period, we have not only the ancient Kemetic star chart or sky map, of constellations, but we also have combined with that the uh, the Greek constellations, which were in use at that time. So we have both there at Dendera, and um, so it's a very in, important uh, uh, temple or representation to look at to learn about the ancient African uh, depiction of the sky or sky or star chart, as well as the one. Current and current use by the Greeks at that particular time. For example, the ancient Kemetic people, what, what the ancient Greek people called Capricorn was called Ba or depicted as a ram by the ancient African people. What the ancient Greeks called Cancer, the crab, was uh, depicted by the ancient. What the ancient uh, Greeks called Capricorn was, de was depicted by the ancient Egyptians or the ancient Kamites as Ba, the ram. What the ancient Greeks called Cancer, the crab, was depicted by the ancient Kamites as Kepler, mm -hmm. a beetle. So all of the people of the world actually have their own way of viewing and describing the various constellations that appear in the sky, even though they're the same for everyone, but everyone sees them different according to their own cultural concepts and ideas. So at Dendera, both the Greek and the ancient uh, Kemetic constellations are depicted. How much older is the ancient Kemetic calendar than the Greek calendar? When did the, when did the Greeks come about to uh, put together the calendar? It's and were, and were, was their calendar influenced by the uh, ancient uh, Africans? Absolutely. There are sky charts or star maps that go all the way back to the 5th dynasty. And those are just the ones that we know about. But it's, it's quite logical to, to think that they're, they're very ancient. They go back very far, even 
they had to have been known, as the stars and the constellations had to have been known before the calendar came into being. Um, so the Greeks probably learned the whole science of astronomy in the first place from the ancient African people. And therefore, they, they learned the, the mapping of the sky from the, from the Kemites, and then they simply uh, defined and described the constellations that were there in terms of their own cultural concepts. Uh, that, that has to be, so more has to be said about that. The, um, the ancient Greeks, uh, they had no calendar in effect. That is to say, on the order of accuracy and stability as the solar calendar. They had a lunar calendar, mm -hmm. which is, which is um, nothing compared to the accuracy that you can get with a solar calendar. And as I pointed out, it's not related to the agricultural cycle. Mm -hmm. So in effect, when the Greeks came to Egypt at that time, uh, they learned everything truly about a real calendar from the ancient Kemites. And they also learned a great deal about astronomy, as you know, could be pointed out, from them. And this is feared because there is no real history of Greek astronomy up until the time they entered Egypt. Mm -hmm. So, so it, the, the stage is set and the data is there. It's not a matter of opinion. And I just want to say one other thing about the, uh, the astronomy versus uh, the, the question you were talking about taking up. Um, there is a bum rap that's sort of given, you know, thrown on the Kemites, that is to say the Egyptians, that they were very much engaged in soothsaying and, and, you know, witchcraft and sorcery and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. No, there was a clear distinction that they made between scientific involvement and religious and spiritual and otherworldly type endeavors. There was a clear distinction they made because astrology by itself could never create the calendar. Astrology helped create astronomy, you see, the science of astronomy. Mm -hmm. Because in order to, that is to say, find your house in the sky and that type of thing, you have to know where your planet is. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to know where your planet is, you have to know how to chart the skies. So astrology is not a science. Right? Astrology is a belief, cultural, that type of thing. And it may be some validity to it, it may not. It's more than it is and it is not. But astronomy is an actual science, and astronomy grew out of astrology. So had they not had astrology, they would have never had astronomy. Had they not had astronomy, they would have never had astronomy. Mm -hmm. So we're really talking about and relating the zodiac and how people uh, want to read the zodiacs in terms sure, of science, so, so. etc. Now, uh, but how how does that zodiac affect um, the charting of the stars, the twelve cardinal points? You speak of that. Well, a little. Uh, I don't want to go too far into this because I'm not, quote, an astrologer. But the calendar still has some vestiges of, astro of astrology. You see, they had they divided the sky into the 12 houses of the 12 constellations. They also call them demons, right? And that's shown in the 12 months of the calendar. Mm -hmm. right? But it just so happened that 12 months of 30 days each fit exactly within a year. That is to say, 360 days. So the 12s match the 12s and everything was good. And there's another thing there. The Earth, you know, revolves on its axis every 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, 24 divided by 2 is 12. So the 12 houses, the day of the, of, of, uh, a given day, the 24 hours, and the 12 months in the year, there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm. So I suspect they knew the revolution of the Earth first. Mm -hmm. You know, and then said, let us divide this, let us divide all of life, if you will, into 12 segments. Okay? But that was part of the religious system, part of primitive beliefs, and part of some other things that I really don't know where they got it from. But they knew the difference between that and science. You see, they knew the difference. Because had they not known the difference, you would never have gotten that calendar. And, and all the other mathematics that they knew in science, they knew the difference. How, how does all this information relate to African American people today um, in our struggle for liberation? Why should one want to redo the calendar, study the calendar? We have a calendar, you know. Why should we know more? If you have a way of asking the most yeah, <laughs> the final two, questions. Two types of answers to that. I'll sure. answer the first yeah. and then let this, because there, there is the cultural, social aspect of it. Of a, of a calendar, and then there's the science of the calendar, which is important. 
So I could just address really the, the social cultural aspect of the calendar. The calendar that that we use that's being used today, uh, that calendar that was uh, designed by the Western world, mainly the Gregorian and the Julian calendars, are calendars which um, express Western cultural culture and Western cultural concepts. For example, um, the the aspect of the seven day week, which uh, was uh, really introduced into the calendar during the time of Constantine by the Christians, corresponds to their to their cultural concept or idea of the seven days of creation and then the Sabbath Sabbath day being the rest day, the seventh day. Um, Wait a minute. There was not seven days. No. No. Was no. There was the first time I ever heard. Oh really? Yes. Well, the ancient Kemetic calendar had a a month of th exactly thirty days each, and so there were actually three three sets of ten. So there was a ten day week, and it wasn't until the time of Constantine when when they had their own calendar design that they introduced the seven day week, which was not commensurate with the, with the month, with the actual astronomical cycle at all. So it caused the calendar to, the days of the calendar to continuously change, and there became that, that aspect of changeability in the calendar, which we will probably say a few words about. Also, they began to name the days of the week after uh, Indo-European Indo gods, and um, so every time we actually say the names of the days of the week, we are, in a sense, evoking the Indo-European or Saxon gods and, and giving reverence and, and homage to them. Also, the Western calendar is designed to, um, to regulate its, its working system, its, well, for the most part, the capitalistic system and, and the working system of the society as a whole. Another thing is that it depicts European and Western holidays and celebrations, um, as, and, and does not depict celebrations and holidays of, of African people. So every time we use the Western calendar, mainly the Gregorian and the Julian calendar, we are participating in their culture and their way of life. We are evoking their gods, and we are, we are evoking their cultural concepts. That is why it's imperative, really, for African people to to use a calendar which speaks to them, which uh, gives reverence and pays pays homage to to our culture and our cultural concepts. Yes. So I'm going to let Reese talk about the other aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, that was excellent. What what she said, and but here is the serious thing about that. You asked. You know, said you have a way of asking these very deep questions in a very subtle way. Uh, and I can answer this one straight away. You said, how does it relate to our liberation struggle? And you know, we have a calendar, you say. That's just it. The only people that have a calendar is us, African peoples. That calendar, the one that you said, we have a calendar, that is an African calendar. You see, that calendar started with the ancient Kemites. Mm -hmm. Julius Caesar, when they invaded Egypt around 42 BC, they had uh, a very clumsy and inefficient lunar calendar. So they took this calendar wholesale with no changes whatsoever, including the leap year. That's why it's called the, uh, excuse me, the, the uh, Julian calendar. But Julius Caesar had nothing whatsoever to do with its invention, its modification, nothing at all. All he did was steal it and put his name on it. That's the origin of your Julian calendar and your so-called Julian date. Furthermore, they were so superstitious, they changed the first day to January 1st, which there is no scientific reason for that at all, you see. Then, Pope Gregory came along in the 15th century, around 1582. The calendar had already lost about 13 days because it, it tends to slow down. I mean, it tends to run ahead. So he had two of his scientists try to correct the problem. But since they had no scientific methodology, they were guessing, you see. So they guessed how to you know, make the calendar a little better. And then he put his name on it. That's why it's called the Gregorian calendar. 
And that is the calendar that's hanging on the wall today. That is not a European invention. That is an African calendar. So when you say, how does it relate to our liberation struggle? It relates this way. They tried to say African peoples had no history. In fact, when I was going to school as a, as a youth, I was taught that until I began to read. Not only do we have a history, no one else has a history compared to ours, you see. Mm -hmm. And each time any European person wishes to say we have no history, all they have to do is ask themselves, what time is it? And they're talking about us because the time is defined by the calendar. And the calendar is an ancient African invention. Okay. With all the crack and, 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 and narcotics and, and, and destruction of our children in the school system, it is important that they know their people did one of the most important things in terms of the human uh, existence on this earth. Without the calendar, you have no physics, no astronomy, no history, no medicine, nothing that involves any sense of time, you see. And you said we're going to do another program on the calendar. At that time, I'm going to great detail as to what I mean by that, and this will be backed up. And just one other thing I need to say, um, with the calendar, yes, as we kept you pointed out, it has all these European names. For instance, uh, uh, August is named after the Emperor Augustus, and July named after Julius Caesar, and so forth which is meaningless, because neither one of them had anything to do with that calendar. Mm -hmm. But the calendar itself, without those names, is the African calendar. Therefore, it becomes extremely important what Rekete has done, in that she's reclaimed the original names, you see, in hieroglyphs. So if we then learn the original names, and we learn Shamu, and Pert, and Aket, and so forth, Rempent, and so and so forth, and all of that, we will be invoking African gods when we refer to the calendar. But the calendar mathematically is the same calendar. They just sort of clouded it with European wording, you follow. But that is an ancient African invention. And changed the days. Uh, the Absolutely, days. they changed. They, they, they made some modifications that, again, had uh, really, I can't see the reason why. For instance, Constantine the Great was the one that made the week seven days. Mm -hmm. But that was made to reserve their religious holidays. Whereas the seventh day they call the Sabbath was a day of rest and so forth. Mm -hmm. The ancient calendar had ten days in each week, not seven. You see. And so that was done. Furthermore, they changed the length of the lengths of the months themselves. The ancient African calendar had 30 days each month. Mm -hmm. Now, that may not seem like a major thing, but it is. By keeping all the months the same days, each day remains the same in your calendar. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely intelligent calendar. For instance, when we do show it, you'll notice it has no date. Like, for instance, the calendar we have on the wall now was, say, uh, 1987. Mm -hmm. This is a perpetual calendar. It, it doesn't have to have a date because the days never change. For instance, my birthday this year was on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. Next year it'll be a Friday. Next year it'll be Saturday and Sunday. It'll cycle. According to our present Exactly, calendar. exactly. But according to the ancient African Kemetic calendar, whatever day my birthday landed on, or anybody, the day, or any date that is to say at all, will always land on the exact same day, as well as the exact same numerical day, you see. It's an extremely intelligent calendar. Mm -hmm. Now that calendar concept was copied by some folks that were calling themselves the uh, World Calendar Association. Mm -hmm. And when I recall reading that about six or seven years ago, and I thought it was quite clever, not knowing that that's nothing more than a copy of the ancient African Egyptian calendar in its original form. They called it the world calendar, you see. But back to our liberation struggle, once this information has gotten out to our children and the adults, that not only did we do great things, we did things that are still defining the world. Everybody uses that calendar, you see. And then we can, you know, you, know, you can take it a little further. Uh, I invented the best calendar that could possibly be made, but the base of it is that calendar right there. Let's take a look at that calendar. And let's talk about it. Let's talk about how it came about. Can you hold it up and get some close-ups of it? Can you see it? Is it too much glare? <laughs> Yeah, that's a, can you hold it around a little bit? Around a little bit? Yeah, watch the monitor. Okay. All right, that's good. That's good. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
what we're looking at now on the screen is the drawing which depicts the star on which the calendar year is based. This star was called Sulpetit by the ancient Kemites. Today, by, uh, it is called Sirius by modern astronomers. And of course, the star Sirius is very important to African people all over the continent. When this star rises helically, or heliacally, that is, with the sun in the early morning twilight, an event which occurs once each year, that's where the ancient Kemites marked the beginning of the year. And they called it the Paris Sopet, 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 the coming forth of the star Sopet. That was day one of the year, the heliacal rising of the star. Okay. Here um, we see the calendar itself, which is divided into three seasons. The first season being the inundation season, Shinu, water. The second season, Teret, which means the growing season or the coming forth season. And the third season, Akhet, the harvest season, which is depicted with a, a field of growing plants. Each season has four months. Each month has exactly 30 days, which gives us 360, a 360-day year. And because the year is longer than that, the, extra, the five days longer of the year are added at the end of the year. Each of the five days for the Kemetic people just symbolize or represent one of the, the Netchers or, or gods, if you wish, of the ancient people. And in 1988, this calendar is, corresponds to the Gregorian calendar of 87 and 88. We will have the leap year, the concept which was invented by the ancient Kemetic themselves. The, this particular calendar is made to correspond to or is synchronized with the Gregorian calendar now in use by the Western world, just so that um, we can know where we are in relationship to the Western calendar. Okay. There's something here, there's, as, as I was pointing out to you, how intelligent this calendar is, and it's in it right here. The fact that this is in a block, the, this season, that season, that season, four months, four months, four months. But this is 120 days, 120 days, 120 days, which makes 360. Notice the five days are separate from these blocks. These are the five days down here, festive days of the year, the leap year. That is what makes this calendar so scientifically intelligent. By all of these months being the same length and each season being the same number of months, the days never change in this block, you see. Mm -hmm. By leaving those five days out, you maintain what you call high unchangeability. The calendar never changes. For instance, uh, Lisa Ra 1 is on a Sunday. It will always be on a Sunday because of the way in which you count. Now that takes a little bit of explaining, which I won't go into now, but suffice it to say that it's because of the arrangement 120, 120, 120. If you notice, our present calendar has 29 days, 30 days, 31 days. That is what keeps the calendar changing incessantly, you see. Mm -hmm. So they were extremely clever people. They knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. And if you notice, there's no date here. You don't see 1987. You don't see any date at all. Because this calendar is good for all time. Now, I might also point out one other thing to you. The original African calendar didn't have these beautiful designs at all. This was Riketi's doing and the artists, you see. So this we made it this way, suitable for framing, such that when, when, uh, when we purchase it, we should look at this on our walls. This should be in every African house, everywhere they're Africans. This calendar should be there. That's why they made it, we made it so beautiful. How would one go about purchasing this calendar and finding out more information about uh, what you talked about today, did you also publish a book on it? Oh, yes, yes we, we, uh, we, we published a book that explains the calendar, and it also explains the science and mathematics of calendars in general, because there's no point in doing all this if a person can't understand what's here. And as I pointed out, Riketi has put the original hieroglyphs here and the original names. And so this book is a guide to the calendar, the first part of it. And the second part of this book
tells you all about the complexity of making a calendar. It is not an easy task, okay? And in fact, to that extent, let me point this out. It's a little difficult to say without sounding, you know, as if I'm bragging, but that's, it has to be said. No peoples were able to develop a science of calendars. They were all guessing as to how to keep the calendar accurate. Well, in the process of us doing this work, uh, I developed and created the, the first science of calendars. And that, that science has enabled me to make, as I pointed out earlier, the most accurate calendar that can be made by the solar system. The only way that calendar can change is the solar system itself has to change. You see, so all of that's in the book. And there's another publication that, that I'm doing. Uh, it's far more technical for our African scientists and engineers and scholars that would like to go to the full extent. This calendar goes into outer space calendars and all of that. But it's important for our youth to see this book and to read it and to try to understand it. How would one uh, go about getting that? Is it sold by a regular source? Well, we don't know if we're allowed to make a commercial here, but uh, we have flyers and you can mail it, uh, you mail in the flyers to the Harlem Mathematics Academy. We're using that as a distribution center. And we also have sent the books to different black bookstores throughout America. Oh, also, I have to tell you, it's been installed in the Schomburg Library. It's also been installed in the Langston Hughes Library out in Queens. And we're presently trying to get it into the entire library system. Mm -hmm. Also at the lecture series, First World and ASCAC and so forth, we sell them there. Mm -hmm. And um, this book and the calendar sell for $25. And it's certainly working. This is suitable for framing and it really should be in your house. Let me phrase this question another way. Mm -hmm. So if you want us to continue um, holding something? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, uh, most of the research and the work of this calendar can be found where you're, uh, where you're presently the director, and that is where? Oh, that's the, the Harlem Mathematics Academy. So if one would come to the Harlem Mathematics Academy, they can get further research on this? Oh, sure. And really, for the lay person, they should start with this book. Mm -hmm. This book is titled The Calendar Project. We're taking that book together. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, it's written in such a style that there is mathematics and physics in it, but, but there's a reason why that was done also. You see, there's this myth again that they try to perpetrate that African peoples are, are not very scientific. You know, we're good at basketball and, and, and music and that type of thing. That's the world's worst, worst myth. The ancient Chemites were the leaders in mathematics and science and physics and all that. They invented all of it. And it's as natural as rolling off a log. So we wrote this to try to encourage African peoples to get back to being as great as we were in the sciences. You see, and this is an excellent book to start with. Mm -hmm. So, in order to get it, you would have to just write to the Harlem Mathematics Academy. We have flyers. We'll send it to you, and you can order it. What is the address? Well, the address is is obvious. You could say the most important aspect. But for our young people, mm -hmm. what? is key for them to absorb, to effect a change in their consciousness that will ultimately lead to real liberation of African people. Okay. Um, that question is, again, extensive. You know, and no. yeah, there, there is no real one thing, but there are certain components that I think are critically important. And the first is self-realization as an African. Mm -hmm. You see, we've been taught as a people to hate ourselves to hate our, our history, to hate our country, when in fact all of humanity stems from us. And, and the majority of the wonderful and profound things this world has, we invented. Mm -hmm. So firstly, our youth and adults, you know, have to be made aware of our extensive, great, and profound history. That there's no shame whatsoever in being an African. Mm -hmm. None whatsoever. In fact, it's the highest form of human being. So that certainly is crucial, you know, the, the cultural and the historical content. Without that, I think you have nothing because you're just producing clones that will do what someone else tells them mm -hmm. because they already think of themselves as worthless and therefore they can gain some measure of esteem by having someone else direct them, mm -hmm. especially if they're taught that this other person is superior and they're inferior, you see. So they're constantly groping at nonsense. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that certainly is first. And then, and this, this isn't just because I'm a scientist, uh, science and the doing of science, the learning of science, the daily bathing in science is critical. 
the world is going to be shaped as it is right now by scientific minds. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, the people that control science and technology will control the world. So it's as simple as that. So then it is crucial for African youth to develop a scientific understanding. Absolutely. Of a scientific mentality, a scientific outlook, you see. Mm -hmm. Because I have a theory about this. Our creativity journey comes through in the channels that we're allowed to express it in a broad sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And in America, generally, it's been sports and music. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is extremely limited. Our creativity is so broad and so enormous that we can do the same things in any endeavor you choose to mention, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you know. And and my mission, if you will, or my divine, sacred uh, project, is to affect young African children. Um, shall you put him in the basement? Uh, he got loose. Hold on a moment. We're doing an interview, Linda. The way you were relating it to the areas of development that uh, you have to go. Wait till she go up so we don't pick up the uh, background noise. You can come back down if you want to. The dog has made a mess. But see, the dog is my uh, god at night. <laughs> <laughs> he goes down to the basement and protects all the equipment. That's how it's standing. He's <laughs> Go ahead. I'm okay. Sorry. Um, see, our youth are being misguided, and really, in effect, they're being destroyed. Mm -hmm. And is that a conspiracy? Oh, I, I, now is it a conspiracy? You see, there's two ways to stop greatness. One way is to simply stop it outright. Another way is to convince it, get hold of its mind, and convince mm -hmm. it that it's worthless. Then it will stop itself. And that's what they've done to us as a people, and are doing to us as a people, and especially mm -hmm. our youth. And you see, it's easy to do to the youth because, you know, young people are gullible, they have no experience, and they, they really don't know how vicious this system is. You see, if you take two children, you know, one is a Caucasian, whatever, and the other is an African child, uh, they're going to grow up and compete with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, so in order for the Europeans to maintain all the spoils and all the power and everything else, they have to stop that child. You know, if you can hinder that child and dement that child, mm -hmm. when it is a child, mm -hmm. it will grow up to be an ignorant person. Easily controllable, easily used, easily abused. So it's a very, very simple thing. Now, I'm going to say something to you that may sound a little strange. We seem to be have this great concern with uh, the crack in the neighborhoods and the dope and that type of mm -hmm. thing. Sure, that's certainly critical. There's no two ways about that. But there's something far, far more critical than that. And that's the school system. Oh, yes. That's the school system. Because once you get a hold of the child's mind and you destroy that, you don't need crack or anything. That person is already useless. Mm -hmm. That person will never amount to anything. And in fact, that person will be forced to turn on his own kind to survive. And that mm -hmm. may take on violent means, any means that person can dream up. Mm -hmm. You see, because they say, well, we'd like to hire you and so forth, but you have no skills. You can't read. You can't do any mathematics. So it's not racism on our part. You just don't know anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, after 20 years of miseducation and abuse and neglect, it's actually true. You don't know anything. So... That's the general broad scope. Now let's get specific. Science, mathematics, our children are taught systematically, thoroughly, methodically, that that is not for you, you can't do it well, and basically you should be doing something that doesn't tax you as much. And they try to draw this frame of reference on the children. And after a while, it's quite successful. Mm -hmm. Because they go home and they, and they have math homework, for instance, and the mother says, well, I'm not going to do that, ask your father. He says, well, I don't know that either. So it begins to build up a picture. African peoples don't know mathematics and science and physics. I'm an African child, therefore I shouldn't have to know it either. Why should I crack my head with that? Let those other folks do it. And so long as you let those other folks do it, they will control you and your world. The world is becoming more and more scientific, not less. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the education of our children in general and the scientific education in particular, and with that strong cultural base, that is what is needed. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. It's not even a point of debate. That murder is far more significant than the crack and the narcotics and all that. Because you're talking about the entire country and then the entire world. You know? mm -hmm.
because a lot of, let's say, Western folks that I know, my friends and so forth, they come from the Caribbean and they, they say they have a good education. They were taught British forms. But what else was taught? Hold on. What else was taught? You know, you were taught to adore and appreciate and love white people. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if you were also taught at the same time to love, appreciate, and adore yourself. Mm -hmm. But you're not. I studied all the physics I studied and all the mathematics I studied. Not once, not even once, in any of the textbooks that I studied from, was there any mention of Africa as contributing to science and technology. Not one African scientist was ever shown in these books at all, you see. And I have a library consisting of more than 2,000 books, my own personal library I've been building since I was 14 years old. And not in one of those books can you find a contribution by African people, when in fact, the whole foundation of physics and mathematics comes from African people. You see, so I can't overemphasize that Somehow they must go hand in hand. There must be a strong, serious cultural base, which Rikeki will talk about, I think. And there must be a strong, serious scientific base. All the playing and everything else in between, sure, it can have that also, but those two are paramount. And we've got to infect our youth with this way of thinking. That life is more than just rapping, spinning on your head, and basically having a good time. They're making our children very non-intellectual, and we simply can't have that. We somehow have to get control of our youth, claim our youth back, because they're destroying themselves and the world at large is helping to destroy them systematically, especially the young men. Mm -hmm. So it's that strong cultural base and that strong scientific base. If we don't do that, we will perish as a people. There's no two ways about it. Uh, perish? Perish, be eliminated. destroyed, eliminated, wiped out, if you don't think it can happen, absolutely, absolutely. And if you don't think it can happen, so did the Jews during the time of Hitler. That was unheard of, the very idea that someone would exterminate them, but it happened, you see. And what they're doing now is, since things are becoming more scientific and more technical, those things that aren't scientific or technical or, or don't have the ability to negotiate that are considered uh, superfluous, useless. You see, even factory work, there is a factory up in Pitney Bowes in Connecticut Stanford, mm -hmm. Connecticut, that is fully automated. When you open the doors, you don't see any people. These machines are running the entire factory. A person comes in every now and then and looks at things. But basically, the factory is completely automated. So factory work is becoming obsolete. Work that requires lower education, low training is becoming obsolete. They're getting machines to do that. We're now entering the age of robotics. Robots are running around doing things. And they're becoming more and more sophisticated. So those people that do not have science and technology and a scientific base will perish. You'll be superfluous. So, again, you see you touched a, a kind of magic button when you asked that question. Uh, and I could talk at length about it, but I won't. I, I'd like you to hear Rikeki's views on, on, the, on that strong cultural base I was talking about because she has some very strong views about that too. In fact, in fact I think any serious African educator if that is not paramount in his mind, then he's not doing he or she is not they're not doing their job properly. So I can give you a direction that she can elaborate on that. All right. First of all, um, I agree with Reese that culture and science are the two most important aspects of the education of African children. First of all, the cultural base is at the top of the list and perhaps the most important, I think, because African people have a, first of all, African people have a completely different vision of the world than European people do. We have a completely different understanding and appreciation and being than Europeans do. That's right. And because of that, because of our vision of the world, because of the way we are, because of the way that we relate to each other, mm -hmm. and the way that we relate to nature, we uh, we need to we need to really fully begin to to participate mm -hmm. and to develop our natural state of being again. 
for those of us who have lived in the diaspora all of these centuries, we have become, uh, we have taken on the ways of, the, of Western man and, and we have begun to incorporate his vision of the world and, and, and his way of being and participating mm -hmm. in the planet. And that way has proven to be, from time immemorial since the beginning of, of his existence here, very detrimental to, to life itself, to the life of the planet, to the life of the cosmos, to the life of all existence. And so therefore, here we are, functioning and participating and, and learning in that state of being, in that situation, and we are becoming now contributors to, to that destruction and to that destructive force. However, if we understood ourselves, and if we understood our natural state of being, then we would create and produce things that would enhance life and develop life and uh, try to create harmony in, in life. And so therefore what I'm saying is that we must understand ourselves, we must understand the African way, we must develop that so that so that we can, uh, so that we can begin to to produce and create life-giving uh, things for ourselves and for and for the entire earth. Mm -hmm. It is probably not an exaggeration to say that if the European if European science continues in its in the direction that it is going in, that all life is in jeopardy on this planet and that none of us will be around much longer. But if African people could once again come into themselves, mm -hmm. we could begin to, to, to turn that around and, and to move the forces in the opposite direction. Right now, when we go to their universities and their schools, we are taught in their mode of science. Mm -hmm. we, are taught to, we are taught these destructive ways and means of doing things. Even though African people are the inventors of, of the basics, the basis of all of the sciences and arts, it is what the European has done with them and, uh, and how he um, has organized them and how he, has, how he applies his technology mm -hmm. uh, has been nothing but destructive. But yet still, that's what we learn when we go to school. And that's all we learn. So therefore, and, and that's not that's in all fields of science, um, as as well as as, as medicine, mm -hmm. as well as as all of the arts. Everything has been um, has been affected by his mode of thought, by his thinking processes, by his scientific method. You know, mm -hmm. by by the way that that he has decided to to do things. So therefore, we need to know ourselves so that we can create something of African people so that we can create something of ourselves so that we can create something that produces life instead of producing death. And without that cultural foundation, without an understanding of ourselves and without an understanding of the African way of life, we cannot do that. So that is, that's number one, that's essential. Um, and we need to begin to understand that too. Our children need to begin to understand that when we go to school, we are not learning in the way and the mode of, and the mode of production that is of African people. That the science, the mathematics, the physics, the astronomy, um, the space program, medicine, everything is, we need to begin to, to realize that that is not us and that is not of us and that is not the way that we would do things, and that is not the only way of doing things. We, we have this great faith, you know, in, mm -hmm. in European science. We, we see it as some great and glorious, um, um, what should I say? Entity. Entity or something yeah. that we don't even realize that there are other ways, that there are other ways of doing everything. And perhaps, and, and not only perhaps, but it would only actually be those other ways that that can can turn the destructive forces into creative and life-giving forces. 
So it's really, really essential that we begin to to understand ourselves and understand our culture and understand our way of being and our way of life. Science is absolutely, definitely the, the key to the future, but not European scientific modes of, 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 of action and doing things, but an African thought process, an African scientific method, an African creative creative way of being and thinking, acting and doing. That is the way to the future. I think really European Western science has just about gone its limit anyway. That's my own personal feeling. Mm -hmm. um, in every field of science. And that there's got there's got to be a new impetus anyway from, from African people to to carry it a, a step further. Um, the European has created some serious destructive machinery, some serious uh, tools and mechanisms for, for destructive purposes. And therefore, we as African people are going to have to understand those thoroughly, to master those thoroughly, as well as master a new science, which is, which could perhaps be, which is far more formidable than theirs. But we have to know both. And we have to really seriously begin with that. Otherwise, as we said, uh, we are in trouble as a race, and, and the whole planet is in trouble. Um, but there is something there that, that, that should be made absolutely clear. It was triggered when we said as a race, you know, we're in trouble. Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. In terms of minerals, resources, everything. The United States is destroying itself, the land, the actual country itself. So is Europe, the majority of the earth. Africa virtually is, is untapped. It's an untapped resource. Mm -hmm. That's why the South African Nazi regime, and that's what it is, mm -hmm. are, are, are so vicious and so violent because they realize they are entrenched. They have a football, so they're going to try to stay there. If the other nations could get away with the ruthlessness that they do, they would do it because they need Africa's resources and minerals. Well, it's easy to take it if you keep the people ignorant, mm -hmm. especially scientifically ignorant, distort and destroy their culture and their background, make them ashamed of themselves, they'll give it to you for nothing. Literally, they'll give it to you for nothing. And even if they don't give it to you for nothing, you have enough scientific power to take it. So it becomes crucial that African peoples learn science. And it's such a terrible uh, irony that here we have to struggle to get us to understand this again, when in fact, we started out with it. Mm -hmm. We invented it. And, I, and, and another note that she was saying, I'll touch on the humane aspect of science. In all of my studies, I never had a professor say to me, say for instance, we're studying physics, that this is beautiful. I say it's beautiful because to me it is beautiful. It's science is life. Mm -hmm. And when I teach the students at the academy, we say things are beautiful. So they say it's beautiful because children are susceptible to what they hear mm -hmm. and what they see, the visual impact and the audible impact. And when you tell a child, this thing is beautiful that you're doing, they begin to say exactly what you say. Then they, then they actually begin to see the beauty, they begin to feel the beauty, then they always demand that beauty from everything you put in front of them. Mm -hmm. Then that challenges the teacher. If this child is going to demand beauty of you, the highest form, then you must be capable to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you're not, it's going to show through, and the child is not going to be interested in you. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. when they put these teachers in front of our children that are incompetent, don't care about them, you know, and are miseducating them purposely, culturally misguiding them, then of course the child does poorly. Then they say, ah, your child has learning disability. Your child can't be taught well. That's not it at all. It's how well are you teaching and what are you teaching? Mm -hmm. Who wants to hear something negative about themselves all the time? Who wants to hear that I can't read and you are not teaching me how to read? You follow? So mm -hmm. I do fault the school system 
And I'm not talking about the, the righteous African teachers that are teaching there and those that mean well or the Caucasian ones at all. I'm saying that wholesalely, the majority of them, it is useless. You know, and they do not teach our children well. And that is systematically, methodically, and purposely done. And I will challenge and debate anybody on that point to any extent. Because certainly in any school population, there is a certain percentage of children that will not do well. There's a certain percentage that will excel. If you look at the probability distribution, the, the majority of the people fall within that middle region. There's like a 10% type of child that they, they will never do well. There's a 10% type of children that will do exceptionally well. But the majority of the people fit in that great, in the greater region of the probability distribution. So you expect a certain amount of failure, okay? Uh, but the enormous number of numbers of failure that we have, our children attend in school, it cannot be by accident. It just simply mm -hmm. cannot be. Mm -hmm. That is absurd. And furthermore, the same children that are failing in mathematics and physics, when they come to the Harlem Mathematics Academy, all of a sudden, not only do they begin to pass, they begin to excel. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? The difference is that we are here to teach and you are here to learn. We are here to discipline and you are here to obey. We are here to show that we love and respect you and you are here to show that you love and respect us. We are teaching things that are beautiful and we expect you to feel that way about it. Mm -hmm. We expect you to get excited. You, know, you can get excited about other things than dancing and playing you know, football and baseball and all that and racking and so forth. You can get excited about knowledge. You can get excited about ideas. Our, these type of words are strange to our children. These words are alien to them, you see. The, that, that intellectual uh, tradition is ripped out of them, you know? And they're dementing these children. They're dementing them wholesale. Again, I'll say to you, far more serious and far more significant than the drugs. Because they think that's a natural way of life, to be ignorant and to be silly and to play games all the time and to waste your life away. They think that's the natural order of events because that's what they're taught. I have finally one question for each of you, both in a different category. The first, I want to ask you again, and perhaps both of you may want to answer both of these questions. But I'd like, from your understanding and study of European culture, why is it such a negative culture against life force um, as, as a whole? Um, spiritually, the highest goal of any religious order is to be associated with the wonders of the universe mm -hmm. and to bring life as opposed to death. We live in a culture that is the exact opposite. It, it exhibits selfishness, greed, the personal, me, as opposed to we. Um, it is the exact opposite factors that produce life uh, in its wholesome uh, principle uh, sphere. Why do you think that is a European expression? And to you, Riketti, you spoke of us having to change, bring, get into ourselves, understand an African value to exhibit, to express, to again create an African motif to bring life. You thought that European science has exhausted itself and was on the verge of destroying humanity. Somewhere out there, the understanding of, of science as projected through the African was in oneness with the universe itself. We came about the building of the pyramids because we understood a oneness that we had with God and with, well, with the universal principle, with that uh, undefinable principle. But when we breathe air, we realized that that was the same absolute law of the universe. The water that was in the now river in the ocean was the same water that flowed through our body, so we want to separate from it. Do you believe then that there are principles and secrets and the understanding of all of these things uh, that are locked into the universe that would free us 
that if we can become spiritually in tune, will be unveiled to us, to the mind that again becomes one with the universe because the universe has a mind of, of survival. Why you think about it, perhaps you can ask some more questions. Okay, again, uh, you have a way of asking very powerful questions in a very soft and subtle way. I'll try my best to, to, to answer you, uh, mm -hmm. your question as to why the Europeans are so life destructive and seemingly just mad with the manner in which they're conducting themselves. Um, I've thought about this long and hard, and I've come to the conclusion that uh, it stems from the stupidity of Alan. Mm -hmm. Now, 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 that doesn't mean that they are stupid, you know, because no race of people is stupid. It comes from the stupidity of arrogance, the arrogance of power. Mm -hmm. In other words, mm -hmm. if they took science and immediately saw that they could make some strong weaponry with this, which they did, once you make strong weapons, you can destroy many powerful warriors in a very easy manner. For instance, you could have specially trained troops on the ground, hundreds of thousands of them. One airplane drops two bombs, three bombs. You've destroyed all of them. So that makes you the winner in effect of that conflict. But it doesn't really make you the stronger. You've won a violent confrontation because you have weaponry and systems to help you, machines to do it for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The common valor one-on-one, -on -one, you didn't display that. You had a more systematic and efficient way of destroying them. So that's what they've done with science. Now, that has made them arrogant. They have translated that simple phenomena and really substandard phenomena into some sort of exalted sense of self, that they, in fact, are some sort of superior being, which is total and serious stupidness. There is nothing superior about anyone white relative to anyone black or African. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing superior about anyone African or black relative to anyone white. Mm -hmm. The key issue is, what do you bring to the individual condition of life? What is the quality of your mind? What, is the, what, what, what are your abilities, you see? If they can dement you in such a way that by the time you begin to think about who you are and what you can do, it's already too late because you now hate yourself. Then in a kind of global way, you can stop a whole race of people. And this is what they're doing. By, by, by distorting African history, by, by destroying the children in the school system. Look, if my parents were destroyed in the school system, then I'm destroyed in the same school system, then my children destroyed in the same school system. By the time you hit the fifth or the fourth generation, no one remembers doing anything great. No one remembers that we were ever worth anything. Mm -hmm. Worthwhile, that is. Mm -hmm. So we continue to self-destructive and ignorant ways against each other. So, once you are accustomed to having the power, which is what the Caucasians have, mm -hmm. you become arrogant. And that, arrogant, that arrogance breeds a kind of stupidity mm -hmm. and a contempt. Mm -hmm. You actually begin to think that, in fact, you are, quote, uh, better. Mm -hmm. And all these are relative terms. Better than what? If you're destroying, how can you be better? Now, that's how I feel about that. Mm -hmm. So I try to teach a harmony with the universe, a oneness with the universe, but I also teach concrete facts. Point A to point B. Science is all about that correlation. If you say something, you must be able to, in effect, prove it by making it, you know, uh, materialize. Mm -hmm. Hearsay has no place in science. Speculation, okay, but eventually speculation must be backed up by facts. And of course, all this is limited to our limited ability as human beings to actually observe and interpret what we mean by facts. So without getting too philosophical, that's essentially the issue. I think that they've, they've projected and pushed things so far in terms of this madness for power that they can't even stop. You see, they have made more of the world angry with them than that loves them. For instance, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's the root cause of why they're so afraid of the Japanese. Not so much because the Japanese have this profound technology and they're bringing Hondas and Toyotas into America. That's not it at all. Mm -hmm. They know that that same science can be adapted to nuclear weaponry, mm -hmm. to superior ways of killing mm -hmm. like they have. 
And they also know that Japan is the only non-white country that sustained a nuclear attack. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So in effect, the Japanese have already, quote, been nuked. And I know that they, that they know in their hearts the Japanese have not forgotten that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So here you have a people that are so homogeneous and so close-knit and have sustained this devastating attack and are now getting so strong scientifically that they can retaliate. Mm -hmm. It's causing great fear throughout the Western world. Mm -hmm. It isn't because of Honda and Toyota. Mm -hmm. It isn't because of that at all, mm -hmm. you see. So if you can envision that scenario, now envision the African doing the same thing, who have to have a bigger country and more people and scattered throughout the entire world as well as concentrated in Africa. Mm -hmm. they, they would become a formidable force. That's why they encourage our children to rap, they encourage our children to break dance on their heads, they encourage our children to be irresponsible, they encourage teenage pregnancy, they encourage everything negative and, and devastating. They encourage that. Because the best way to get a person to destroy themselves is to teach them that they are nothing. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what's going on. And it also has affected our adult population. Because I have seen many African people, that is to say, whatever you choose to call us, deny vehemently and almost to the death that they're not African. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like everybody else knows that we're African except us. We're treated as one people, Africans, no matter where we are. But we try to make these internal distinctions, and that's why we're being destroyed. Mm -hmm. So I can end this by saying that this, this idea of, of trying to, this, this sense of destroying life everywhere they go, stems from that insane desire to control. And once you've gone so far, and oftentimes it's impossible to stop. If I kill your brother, you may be angry with me, you may wish to kill me in return. But you also may be willing to forgive me. But then if I come and also kill your wife, and your child, and your cousin, and your friend, and your neighbor, I've done so much ill that there's no way you can forgive me now. Mm -hmm. There's vengeance in your heart, you see. Mm -hmm. So now I've gone so far, I can't stop. Because if I do, you will probably destroy me, so I must try to kill you also. And in, in, in a global sense, that's how I see the Western world, the white world. They've done so much destruction and damage, even against themselves, as Hitler with the Jews. Mm -hmm. How it, It's almost impossible for them to stop and back up. So they either have to be destroyed or whipped into shape and made to be more human. Mm -hmm. One or the other. Because at the rate they're going, as the catcher pointed out, the whole world will be destroyed. You can't have a world of escalating violence. It, it simply won't exist. It cannot exist. So I think that aspect of them stems from that desire to want to stay in control of everything. And that is extremely unnatural. Nothing controls everything. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Thank you very much, Raketi. OK, just I would like to just add uh, something to what Lisa was saying, something that the ancient Kamaks themselves wrote in the 12 dynasties uh, in a prophecy, a very mm -hmm. ancient prophecy, about concerning the European, he said, but whom he called, whom he referred to as the army at that particular time in the, in the ancient language. He said, beware of the army because he is short of water, he is bare of wood, his feet propel his legs forever, and he doesn't, he does not dwell in one place. He is like a crocodile upon your shores, and he is forever troubled to you. So they gave us a warning way back many thousands of years ago about the about the army. Dynasty? Yes. What year was that about? That was about twenty seven hundred BC. And this is written where? Well, that's in a prophecy of of Nefertiti. Well, it's an ancient, it's an ancient text mm -hmm. from uh, an, uh, one of the ancient Kemetic texts. However, that's not the only text that laments and talks about the, the dangerous army, the European and what he's like. There are several other texts also that, that describe him and, and his way of life and, and that constantly tell to, to beware of him. So, I mean, even thousands of years ago, 
he was trouble for African people, and African people you know, wrote about it and for posterity. So I just wanted to add that. You know, yes, please, he, I'm glad. What Thank he you. has said. I didn't know that they, well, I've been looking for prophecies that oh. uh, our people may have left us that would have shed light mm -hmm. on today's time, oh. understanding that they studied the universe um, and they had great wisdom and the wisdom texts and etc., which comes out of the pyramids. So I had been looking for, without realizing, mm -hmm. all of the words of Solomon are really relative because they are the words of the ancient Haman, who wrote them, and who was later, um, it was later uh, adapted mm -hmm. uh, into uh, the wisdom of Solomon. But yes, but there, there's something that's really key that I think should be brought out. Also, I personally don't feel that Europeans or the whites are my arch enemy. In fact, and I feel that African peoples are beginning to get into a kind of paranoia. There's a broader vision. And that vision is this, they are enemies to everybody, including themselves. You see, we're so isolating it and making it they versus us type of thing. But look at Russia versus the United States. There, there lies the, the possibility of global annihilation. And that is not an African country, let's say, it's versus a Western country. Those are two Western countries, two so-called Caucasian countries. So I think the whites even realize that they are a problem, serious problem to themselves, mm -hmm. not just African peoples, you see. So to me, it's far broader than that. They must be stopped. They must. Because you're not just talking about the destruction separately, let's say, of African peoples. Because first of all, it's not going to come about anybody. We will wake up in time. I believe this is the case. And, I, and I'm not so willing to admit that whites have the total capability of doing that anyway. Because from my studies, my nuclear studies, it's virtually impossible to engage in nuclear warfare without at the same time endangering yourself on the massive scale that they would have mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. Because you see, African peoples are diffused throughout the whole world. Mm -hmm. The only way, the most effective way to use nuclear weapons is to get everyone concentrated in, a, in, in the same area and then use it once and you've done it. But how can you use it on yourself to get the enemy at the same time, if you will? That's impossible. Mm -hmm. So I'm not worrying about anything like that. What I'm worrying about is the arrogance associated with their madness to dominate. Because that will lead the world to total destruction. And it isn't just African people versus them. It is they even versus themselves. As a scientist, uh, do you see the possibility, as has some people have suggested, um, because the resources that are in Africa, the devastation of water here and, and space, um, that AIDS as germ warfare has been purposely disseminated in Africa to, to control and to wipe out African mm -hmm. people, that the land will be free for Europeans. Well, I'm not an expert on AIDS, and that is a serious question. You know, uh, I can say this, but as a scientist, we reason with data. We look at data first, and that shapes our conclusions. Based on the data that Caucasians have exhibited, I do not put it past them. In other words, anyone that would march their own kind by the thousands, by the hundreds of thousands, systematically, methodically into gas chambers and furnaces and, and, and operating on children alive and destroying wholesale humanity as as vulgar and as, and as disgusting as that is, I wouldn't put anything past a people that would do that. So my answer to your question is, relative to the data that they've already exhibited and the horrible slave trade that they you know, uh, inflicted on us, their own internal civil war, mm -hmm. the violence that they've wrought against each other, the Hundred Years' War, you know, the Crusades, all of their history points to, and, and this, this, this business about bringing in smallpox blankets to the American Indians, yes. killing off hundreds of thousands of them. Then they name a scholarship, Cecil B. Rhodes, after that, which is total shame, you know, I, I feel, slapped across the face of humanity. Based on that, and, and I could go on at length, 
I do not put that past them. That AIDS could have been something that was, you know, purposely systematically put into Africa. Because if you look at it, a good bit, a good bit of this, if not all of it, seemed to come from the so-called homosexual community. Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, that whole focus has now been shifted to the so-called intravenous drug users. Because now they say we have a large black population doing that. Shifted mm -hmm. to the Haitians, they tried that for a while. Because now you have black people coming in, we've got to dump something negative on them. Somehow it's gotten all turned around and translated into, not only did we start it, we are constantly harboring it. And we're, we're bringing it out to all the others. So you're setting, again, a condition for a destruction of a people. Mm -hmm. So once you just start just destroying Africans wholesale, people will applaud and say, yes, that's the ones with the AIDS, let's get rid of them. Furthermore, their children are ignorant, they don't know anything, they don't care about anything, all they want to do is, 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 is conduct themselves like fools, let's get rid of them. That's right. So the first stage towards destroying anything is to give it a bad name. So I, I, I wouldn't put it past them at all mm -hmm. in terms of purposely, systematically putting AIDS in Africa. I wouldn't put it past them at all. But again, I'll go back to my former statement. Far stronger than the AIDS in the narcotics, in the open violence, is the destruction of the minds in the school system and in the community at large. They can have Africa, if they continue the way they're going, they can walk in and take Africa for a song, they won't have to fire a shot, because they are making so much of the African world ignorant. Mm -hmm. Ignorant of self, ignorant of science, ignorant of unity, ignorant of higher principles, they are making beasts and dogs of us, you see. That is the more serious crime. That is the more serious danger than nuclear, than AIDS, than, 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 than crop devastation, than whatever else they're doing. That destruction of the mind. That, 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 that idea to encourage Africans to hate themselves and their history and their culture. Because once you begin to truly tell African history and culture, White people have no history and culture. It all comes from there. Mm -hmm. And they have the lesser role. And this idea about having the lesser role is, 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 is paramount to death to them. That, that, again, that arrogance of wanting to have all the power. Mm -hmm. You see, so this type of conversation we're having, it could go on at length. Yeah, I, I know. And I'm going to invite you back. Um, I want to thank you. So very much. I think we covered a lot of territory, very important territory. And um, Rochetti, uh, again, I want to thank you, thank you. so very much thank uh, you. for your coming. I'd like to know if, um, as we close, if, if there's a final word, anything you might want to say. Well, we'll let her go first. Well, I, I guess since we really started talking about the calendar, that I'll just say that um, I think it's very important for, for everyone to, to look at the calendar project that we have done to learn more about African science and, and the kind of scientific levels that African people reach and their contributions to the world. I think that all children, since we've been talking so much lately about the ed education of our children, that the children should be exposed to the calendar project, read the book, and, and study it, and, and, and the parents should help them and encourage them to read it, and to think about the science and mathematics that went into the development of the calendar. Yes, I can reiterate that and, you know, really second it. Um, because the nature in which we did the book, again, I said to you, we purposely, I purposely put the mathematics, some of the mathematics and some of the physics into that book because I want the person to struggle with it. I want them to encounter the page and say, I have difficulty understanding this. I'm going to sit here until I understand it because that is what we did as African peoples and that is what enabled us to do all those great things that we did. And there's something else here. This Reese calendar that I was telling you about, uh, the Gregorian calendar, which is the one we have on our walls now, which is the ancient African calendar with a new little leap year rule put in, will lose a day in roughly 3,200 years. 
In other words, it would be off by a day. The Reese calendar, which is the one that I invented based on this study, uh, won't lose a day until approximately 200,000 years. You see? Mm -hmm. And furthermore, I proved mathematically that the solar system cannot provide you with one day. So that calendar has been submitted to the United Nations to try to replace, as a replacement for the Gregorian calendar. So the more African peoples and all people in general that have this book and understand the importance of that, you know, the sooner that could be implemented. And it is imperative that we begin to encourage our children and ourselves to get back to being the serious scientists, thinkers, scholars, religious figures, leaders that we once were. Because our destruction is being wrought right now, a good deal of it being done by ourselves because we have no knowledge of self. And that's really the point I would like to leave the audience with. Uh, we must reclaim all of ourselves. We are not Negroes. We are not American black people. We are African peoples that were transported to America. So in effect, we call ourselves African Americans, but we are also African Caribbeans, Africans in Brazil. Wherever we are, we come from one family. And until we pull that family back together, then we are at risk. Thank you so much for, for having us. Coming from Kemet, bringing comedic thoughts and ideas, and they becoming uh, some forgotten and some subverted into the cultures that were already there. And so thus it's no surprise that we can find a wealth of data and material. And then if you're not sure, we, in our class, uh, we uh, translated some documents of, um, of Harkuf. His date is 2700 BC to 2190 BC. And in that book that uh, I uh, wrote, Help to Light, Malefic was the main author, of course, uh, but it was a committee of people to get the journey of man, right? Uh, the textbook that I don't have to show up, but I think many of you have seen it already. And if you look in that book on page 24, you'll find some information about the journey that uh, Harkuf took at that time in the old kingdom. And it says, the adventures of Harkuf, governor of Aswan, demonstrates the cultural exchange and trade that flourished between Kemet and sub-Sahara Africa during the old kingdom. Harkuf, governor of Aswan, went on three expeditions to the interior of Africa about 2130 BCE to uh, uh, places that appeared to be in the Congo Basin. In the Congo Basin, you see. So that's, you know, he and his caravan of uh, camels and donkeys traveled more than 1,600 kilometers, which is 1,000 miles, 1,000 uh, miles across the Sahara to the Ituri rainforest in Central Africa when he visited the Twa. Uh, in one of his diaries, he wrote, and then here's a translation here of something in the diary. We did some translations in the class, but it wasn't this particular one. I have come here from my city. <coughs> well, I have descended from my gnome in OME, and so that's what we're going to be looking at with the normal palette, the gnomes that came from pre-dynastic times. I have built a house, set up its door. So we're talking about the legs walking. I have dug a pool, planted sycamores. The king praised me. My father made a will for me. I was one worthy, end quote. So he was a worthy person of attention and praise. He received uh, that because of his expeditions that were so far into the boundaries that went what we call the boundaries beyond Ethiopia. You know, I called my people. And on and on, there's more. I don't want to have other quotes, etc. but I think I made that particular point. But if you want to read some more about my book, certainly you can get it from the Journey of Man, uh, uh, that particular uh, book. And um, that is, uh, that's there. And then, of course, the Hebrew Israelites have written material showing the movement you know, Asiel, Prince Asiel, uh, his group uh, of black Hebrew Israelites, 
and those uh, uh, with uh, Rabbi Cohen in Ghana uh, have done some research in reference to that particular move and its uh, a continuous uh, follow. And then I've done some work too in reference to the clans of the uh, Ghanaian people uh, and the clans and the gnomes that you find in ancient uh, Kemet. But uh, with that, let's go and begin to look at the uh, visuals that I have. Um, uh, James, can we dim the lights? Yes. Amongst the uh, 
Bakuba people called Woot, W-O-O-T. And the patterns in association with him is a circle that rotates and is referenced to the knee. So that this knee concept in stylistic pattern we find continue with the Bakuba in the Congo. I just told you about her, Hakuf, right? Going to the Congo. So these things are not unusual. Next. Then we know the beard, the false beard, right? If it's rectilinear, it's this world ruler. But if it's curving up, it represents resurrection. So the motion and movement of the legs becomes the curled up uh, uh, form. Okay, here's all the battle scenes. Often want to show the figure with the legs astride, as well, of course, with the mace hand and coming down. Even some staffs will have legs on it, we'll see, and they too can walk and move and be in stride. Ramesses VII, uh, uh, destroying the Assyrians. Next. Okay, cave art. Uh, those formulas we find there. Uh, the two shoulders forward, yeah, and from the waist down, you have right uh, on the side view. Side view, and from the front, two shoulders forward. Same thing over here, two shoulders forward, and then the side view. In cave art, before you have the uh, dynasties. Next. So the symbolism, here's the Benin that I mentioned where they would twist the body, uh, twist the legs sometimes to show you that concept. Next. There's also the knee. Next, the twist. And here, a resurrection. To rise up and walk. Next. Okay, the, uh, uh, okay, here's the spirit door. Uh, ASCAC in Detroit put out a, a, a publication on the spirit doors, on a particular one, and analyzed and talked about it. But uh, in the, uh, Jehutimus was telling us, showing us at the Hatshepsu exhibition, uh, had us reading the data on the uh, glyphs uh, uh, here, on these various ones, and talking about them as uh, altar pieces. But what? You're coming to them with your spirit that your spirit might have life and be able to walk through doors. Next, uh, the false doors, etc. And here's an old picture of myself again in Ethiopia, in Aksum. I have this little uh, 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 pants thing on. And I uh, was young back then. I uh, we went to Haley's Lots of Pot Palace, and he had his lions there, etc. But here's where are these doors going to? Where are these windows, doors going through? It's the same concept. You see these windows and doors uh, straight on up. Next, legs walking. So legs walk through those doors. Next. All right, now here we have the famous Nama Palette. Uh, this is the uh, uh, front side, uh, 3100 BC, about, uh, so that it's the unification of upper and lower. And uh, we have the crown we know all about already, right? Uh, the white crown uh, on top, the mace head, the legs astride representing the motion and movement. The bull tail, some people say it's the uh, a lion's tail, but I think it's the bull's tail uh, of power from, because he's also represented as the bull, and up top, Kepuru, and the seal of the astrodome of the temple with the catfish chisel, the name that represents menace, the priest with the head that's kind of like ball, uh, carrying the sandals, uh, walking on holy ground as Moses did, that flip was taken and redone uh, for uh, uh, biblical data, but carrying the incense, and then control over the breath of life. The, so it's the opening, this, this is not the stick that, the stepping rod to open up the, um, uh, the mouth ceremony, but this one is controlling the breath of life. And then we have the glyph here in the back, this rectilinear glyph. I guess if it's a light, it's not doing it too. Doesn't here. Don't want to 
remind me to do it. I don't know why. It's too bright. But they used to do it. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> not as battery. I need some new battery. That's right. That's what it is. I need some new battery. But anyway, the rectilinear shape is in the back. That's the land glyph, the top. Top. And then underneath that, by the man's head to the right, is a shape that's like a harpoon. And so we think that that may be a harpoon. Another idea that might be a rib, but we think more harpoon. And then underneath that is another box with wavy lines, meaning water. Water. Oh, it might be fire, but I think it's water that's in that. And then, of course, we have uh, some samples of the architecture here. Uh, the forts and dungeons in Ghana, that you see that shape, that was a medieval shape um, right in here, that we say, oh, those are the medieval castles, rectilinear uh, forms. <coughs> but here, the 3100 BC, so before Europe was born, it was down here, and then the fallen uh, uh, people next. Now, here's a detail showing that, of course, we love this detail because it shows how Afrocentric this woman is. The big head of fuzzy hair and the, uh, on the, the little beads on the back of uh, some locks, you know? And then uh, uh, her nose is uh, uh, spreading out like Afrocoid nose and uh, lips, inverted lips. Uh, and then she wears, she's got to be a priest because she wears the leopard uh, skin uh, and deals with the um, uh, uh, incense, swinging the incense. And so she is very important. Here's Catfish Chisel, the, the hieroglyphic form again. Uh, of course, we know all of the standard things. I don't want to talk about the standard things you already know. Uh, next slide. All right, now here's what I'm interested in, too, and that is uh, carrying the staff. Here she is on the top register, right? And so that at top you have the astrodome realm. This realm you have the divine kingship, the rulership realm. This realm you have the battle of humans. This realm you have the underworld, so to speak, the killing, the kill. Uh, uh, somewhat, you see, so that these registers are very important in the uh, lineup. And then, of course, you have the dead, the decapitated uh, numbers here, and above that, you have the bird and a door. We just looked at door spirit doors, and so that the bird going through the door is like the Teru or the Bob bird that goes through the door, and then next to him, a boat the uh, boat way up top in that section. But we're going to concentrate on the long, tall, pole, tall poles and what's on top of the poles because those are the things that come from uh, the pre-dynastic uh, period and time. Next. Okay, this is the tomb of uh, Seti at Abydos. And you see the same. Uh, standards, right? You see the Horus, you see the Ibis, and the Upwat, you see two canine beings, and um, you have the circle of Ra with the feathers, plumes, two plumes coming up, and then you have this. Now this is the big discussion. This. What is this? Sometimes it uh, dips in like a kidney, and sometimes it's like just a bundle of loaf, as if it's a loaf of bread that with one end top up like that. But that's the symbol that I believe is the placenta. Years ago, I asked Dr. Ben, way back at the time when I was working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I asked Dr. Ben, what's that? And so he said, it's a kidney. That's what he told me. Oh, that's the time. Oh, OK. Okay, good. Thank you. Oh, there you go. That's the battery. It's got some juice. Thank you. It's got some juice. Yeah, so I asked Dr. Ben, so Dr. Ben said, it's a kidney. And, um,
But in, uh, a few years ago, I was doing more and more, because I'm always looking for all kinds of things. And uh, then I heard, I think Jerusalem told me, he said, no, that's a heart. And then, or a lung. Or, um, there's a third thing, it's a heart, a lung, or something else. But the word EMT is a cross that means within. Within. And then I found some other material, which I may not mention all today, but you know it's in the book that I wrote that's not yet printed, but the most recent one on mother and child, where it's uh, was telling, talking about, I have the passages quoted exactly from where, says that the uh, placenta is within, means the internal most part of the body. And the kidney means the innermost part of the body. So that it's obviously a multi-referential thing and the important thing is that you're talking about the innermost part of the body that deals with life and death. And so therefore that's why I feel okay by calling it a placenta. And uh, also, there's some other people that have referenced it as placenta, but without giving you the full reasons why. And so the contribution to the field is these other reasons that I'm uh, putting it in. Because the word renal is used. Renal means kidney. And renal means, in French, reign, to rule and to reign, and also means queen. So you have queen ruling and reigning, and you have an organ that deals with life and death, you know, with the water, you know, and women in water, then you have something that's very interesting. Next. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now, so here are the hieroglyphic words for uh, placenta, right? Here the moot, remet, here is the word, and so for the placenta it had moot in it, and here is the T, and so moot, of course, we all know about moot. She's the, the, the dark black vulture that comes what? From within, from with deep in the universe, or associated with our men, the blackness. Like coming out of the blackness, like raw is light, moot and our, our, our men is the unknown. So moot is unknown. The unknown blackness within is what the placenta is. So that's what they're describing it as here. You see? And then the child, they have the little figure of the child and this, the water jug, which is uh, uh, like a belly, but it's a container, a container of what of light uh, and witness uh, uh, existence. And so that's what a child is, is existence from the light, you know, the light, the, you know, here uh, is what that is. And then the umbilical, that's another lecture about the umbilical cord. That's another whole lecture. You know, to go back. Uh, next, okay. So here's the placenta. So you, it's, it's all up in here. Within. Next, and so uh, the, the EMT is that cross, and so that's why I think to a lot of places in West Africa they put scarification marks of a cross on the belly at the navel the navel at the center to be within, right? And so now, if you look at um, the ceiling of uh, Astra the Vault, you'll see Moot here. On the other side of Moot, that's not in this slide, is the symbol of mess. The, the, uh, the fox tails tied together. The fox tails tied together. Uh, so mess, to be born what? Out of the blackness and what's there? Figures with legs walking, the motion and the movement, the child is going to come down from this table toe like an umbilical cord uh, held by um, Hapi and held by the waters out of heaven that comes flowing down with the crocodile ancestors uh, giving you the right push and urge that you need to be born. Next. 
thing. And so here's the, uh, this is this is a piece of the mess, it's in the cut of the book. But here's the cords, right, the cable cords that go on down to earth, right? And uh, the uh, other thing. Next, and the bull, you saw the bull. Okay, the, the Kulu people in Gabon uh, with their sacks and vessels. And the Kulu mask itself, this is a, a little imitation of, I mean, I mean, I mean almost like a caricature of the real Kulu mask, the white face mask. Fantastic, beautiful, 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 impressive with the beauty. But they are tied to these bundles that represent the bundles of all that the person and the people are. And so that's why I believe that is the DNA uh, in Ghana that they next, they will use those at the funerals, the bundles. So what's inside, They some of them may have a piece of placenta. In those old books, I was talking about the customs of eating the placenta in the South and uh, parts of Africa, and burying the placenta, etc. Uh, next slide will show you um, the here this bundle uh, of the Akan for a funeral bundle, and so that I think sometimes they bury them right, and if you are sick, you can eat little pieces of, and it's supposed to put you back on track. Right? And so I think what's in there are pieces of that. You know how they will have hair and fingernails and a lot of things and put them all together in these various bundles, but they're definitely to do with the mortuary. Now the Puno, the person will come on tall stilts, as if those tall stilts are like those uh, big poles, so that those bags will be pushed up, you know, but also put in a barrel and placed on the ground, right? And that's the use of it. Now, I think the purpose of them is to be associated with land. Next. Let's see. Next. Okay, well, this is a, a, another, um, uh, some more information about it here. But what is Ramesses and the Set Festival doing? He's bringing a land deed to Mert. And so that each one of these are associated with land that we saw on the Nama Palette. And now, uh, if we have the lights, uh, there's more, but you know, because uh, you know, I always have more. <laughs> but I want to put on the light here, and then I want to, uh, uh, Clemson to help me with something. Uh, but while the light is on, I want you to see uh, some pre-dynastic symbols for gnomes for the land. So that that is associated with, okay, here's, here's a pre-dynastic. Uh, uh, you, you won't be able to see, but I'll, I'll come close for the camera but I'll leave it for you to look at afterward, where there's a pre-dynastic uh, reference to tall staffs with birds on top and another one with a package, a bundle. Now this is before the Nama palette. It's so early. Before the Nama palette, you have, uh, you, you have it here? and I'll wait for Clemson when he comes that he can get it too. So he'll see that reference. And then you see the staff here with the bird on top representing the different lands. Uh, you also see a vulture and a, eating a serpent. Vulture eating a serpent and a whole row of scorpions. You see, so there's a negative positive. Scorpions, negative, the enemies. But then scorpion is also related to a woman who was holding the pre-dynastic staff, the gnome, of the seven scorpions. You see, so that those are associated uh, with, with her. And then I want you to, so that you know that that's very, very early. Then I want to read to you the land of those areas, okay? Oh, this one. 
that of course it is a document. Okay, here's some stats, pre-dynastic stats. One of them is probably elephant time, has an elephant and then the various arrows. Uh, two, what looks like serpents on top of these. And then we have another pre-dynastic work here, right? Tekken uh, is, and this one is showing you the beloved, sign for love. Remember I tell you, everything deal with love, 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 life, motion, passion, empathy. That's life. And so here are these land uh, uh, demarcations like those that go on, but this is before the normal power. And then here's the fish with the love symbol, the lion with the love symbol, uh, the various ones representing what? Land masses. And what are those land masses? The city of the eight owls. Beloved of Heru. Ku, the city of the seven spirits. City number two. City of the Seven Tibbirds, T-I-B-B-I-R-D-S. City of the Twins, this is Albert Churchwald's work, but then further some other things that I do, okay? Ancient Nekhen, which was the opposite of El Ka. City of Keferu, because one has a beetle, the Kepa beetle and an Ara symbol, the mouth symbol right here on it. There's a discussion as to whether it's a frog and an aura or whether it's the kepper. But this says kepper. So they thought it was a beetle and not a frog. City of Kau, K-A-U, a beloved of Sekhat. City of Pu, Pu. And you know, when we talk about Pu, it, it is Pu, Pu. <laughs> right, Pu. City of Pu, it is, I am, you know. Uh, beloved of Selk, S-E-L-K, the powers of Pu, and it starts to list it. What are the powers of Pu? Mm -hmm. Eru, right? Amsta, and Hapi, and those of the Red Crown. Then you have city number seven, city of the kings, beloved of the monarch, royal head of the seven gnomes. The gnomes, the land masses that those uh, uh, sticks uh, and staffs, uh, standards uh, represented. And then I went on to look at the old cities from uh, Wallace Barch, and he had uh, the actual uh, names of those cities that uh, amongst the list of them, I underscored those that had to do with of interest to us with those standards. And so one was Elephantine, of course, uh, and uh, says who was the deity there. But the name of Elef Elephant Time was Ta Stick, S T I. And then Apollonop, Apollonopolis, the Greek word, right? And that became Edfu. And what's the original name? Ustes He. U T H E S. And what does it have? So that's one that's significant to us an old city of Nubia of uh, Upper Kennet, and it has the bird symbol on the standard, and next to it is the symbol of resurrection, to rise, okay? And so that those were old, the old thoughts. Another city that would have been held up was your um, Lycopolis, the Greek word, and uh, that was the one with Upuat, you know, uh, there. And it had a serpent and a tree. Kemenu, Kemenu, K-H-M-E-N-U, was an old city, the real name, and then the Greeks call it uh, Hermopolis. And uh, then another one was Sinopolis, uh, or the, I must have been the Arab later called it, al -Kes. A L I think K E S, <coughs> but um, that old city had uh, Ienpu on top of a standard, which is exactly what we saw in the normal palette. Now, uh, because these ta 
know what? We're dealing with life and death and with uh, the progenitors and with land mass uh, all connected and with DNA. I was very much interested in some things that Clemson Brown introduced to me about the DNA of black people. Clemson was telling me that a Yale study, Yale University study, says that black folks have nine strands to their DNA. I said, what? Nine to six. Nine to six. What? Nine strands to the DNA? I said, uh, I walked with and learned that there was two. Oh, oh, oh. You know, that's certainly less than nine. And so, that, and so he ended up, you know, giving me some pages from a larger study. He'll tell you how large. So I want him to come up and tell you how large and some of the details of this. So he's given me some data and information on it. And so, Clemson, if you can come forward to uh, add to my presentation. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. And uh, so you, he'll pick it up where I just, just left off. And um, then so that we working kind of like a little team thing here. OK. This is the uh, study that was done at Yale University. It was done by uh, 16 geneticists from around the world. It was housed at Yale. Uh, but the final, just to tie in with Sister uh, Rosalind Jeffries was pointing out to you, is that they did samples, they did 1,600 samples from uh, all over the world. Samples from uh, Italians, Jews, everybody. And what they determined, and uh, I could better illustrate this, this is out of a magazine that's produced by the uh, African International Foundation in Nigeria, uh, West Africa. Uh, and what they did to illustrate this, they, they, they said uh, global uh, study proves African race scientifically is smart. Uh, and they have, uh, they have uh, first an orangutan who has uh, three DNA series. Orangutan is a pretty smart animal, but he's not as smart as a gorilla. A gorilla uh, has four DNA series. They're dealing with all uh, species of the eighth family and the gorilla is a part of the ape family. He has four DNA series. You can teach a gorilla to interact with a computer, uh, but he's not as smart as a chimpanzee who's also in the ape family. You can teach a uh, chimpanzee not only to interact with a computer, but he can type. He can type up to 200 words, and he has five DNA series. Human beings are considered in the ape family as well, uh, and all humans, according to the study, have six DNA series. And they have Einstein at the very top of the European <laughs> DNA series intelligence. And then they have the African with nine DNA series. And they have, here's where they were taken. They took these from all over the world. But the African is the only human being with nine DNA series, and they have Professor Gabriel Ebo as an example of nine DNA series because he is the person who has formulated the unified field theory in mathematics. That's the work that Albert Einstein and other luminaries were trying to do but could not. It has eluded the uh, solution uh, in humanity. But the African was able to uh, formulate the equation for all motion in the universe and also that equation is the mother of all equations on the planet. Every equation is a subset of gij comma j equals zero. It changes the world. The world has a new paradigm. There's a new world because of this mathematics. This mathematics will literally give us the ability to create, uh, to get enough energy from a cup of water run New York City for days. So just think about that and you know how the world has changed. Everybody on the planet is now moving to understand what he has done except African people who just don't believe that God has so blessed us and that we are that intelligent. But we are back to ourselves. Everything that has been discussed here today is what we were able to do in 
in ancient times and Professor Ebo because things are cyclical is an example of us returning to our original selves. As mathematics tells us how the pyramids were built, how everything was built, and how everything is done. Mathematics is the language of the universe. And we need to find out more about Professor Ebo. We need to support him because the rest of the world is positioning itself to bring forth technology that God has brought to the world through us. Did you get that reference? <laughs> you can have it. But you decided. Oh, the, 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 this is uh, Africa International Foundation for Science Hold and still. Technology. Hold this still. Hold this still so you're on camera. The name of the study. Uh, the study is, uh, you can find the study on the internet. It's Global Distributions of DNA Series uh, at the uh, uh, local CD, local 7, something like that. So, and, oh, um, here it is. Here. here it is right here. Global Distribution of DNA Series, Copyright 1996, American Association for the Advancement of Science. Uh, the greater the number of DNA series, the greater the probability of genius. Uh, there's over 583 pages in the study. This, we just took out a few. Uh, if you want to look it up on the internet, it's Global Patterns of Linkage. Uh, this is equilibrium at the CD4 locals and modern human origins. Uh, it was headed up by uh, Dr. K.K. Kidd at Yale University. Could you hold that still? Could you hold that still? And you can, so if you look up global patterns of linkage, uh, this equilibrium at the CD4 locals on the internet will get this. Okay, so, uh, and then some of this little immediate stuff here is one thousand over one thousand five hundred pages. Okay, so what I'm really saying to you today, and concluding, is that uh, don't take those bundles for granted. Whether it's a Kumpunochi sack, or whether it's a um, bundle that was a funeral bundle, or whether it's the Punu bundle, or whether it was the pre-dynastic bundle on the standard or the bundle on the standard in the normal palette 3100 BC. So never look at the glyph, that's the graphic glyph of the placenta uh, with blind eyes again, and never look at the three-dimensional bundle with blind glyphs that you see on the normal palette and look forward, one day I'll be giving another uh, some information on this same lecture uh, where I'll be taking and talking about the impact what those other strands may be for. The spirituality. That is, I'm sure that is the exactly. priests and you keep that in mind as to what those strands may be for and um, and the significance for the survival of us here, when we talk about land and the land we own, keep in mind gentrification in New York City and all of the various cities. Keep in mind us uh, people talking about survival and moving to new dimensions and the possibilities of humans. And so the future lectures too, I'm gonna to talk about the mother and the child words that are said before you were born that influence you, and words that are said while you're in the bundle in the womb that influence you, and the words that are said immediately after that influence who you are and what you become. So that all of that is linked so that we're not studying a dead language here, you see? We're studying something that's still full of life and full of, uh, of, 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 of information. So that those of you who did not know about the nine strands, then let it be said you heard some information at the conference that you didn't hear before. Uh, with that, I say thank you. Thank you. I love you all.
Dr. Jeffries for bringing this information to us, and also Reverend Clemson Brown, thank you for adding to that lecture. Thank you all for listening so dearly. Now we know the program says there'll be 50 minutes in between each session, but Sashat had us late. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna continue to roll. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna ask you to stand up. And we're gonna do a nook pose. Not the one where she leans over, but the one where she holds her hands straight up in the palm. So you hold up and stretch, and stretch up. Pull her energy down. And when you're ready, you may be seated. many of us. She is the teacher of Jehudimus Mfudishi and to so many others. She was the spark behind this conference. It was her concept over the years that we do something like this. She is a founding member of the Comedic Institute in Chicago, out of which Jacob Carruthers was the founder. She teaches the Meta since 1980. She's a lecturer on languages, culture, and spirituality. She teaches French and Chinese at Russ College in Mississippi, which is the second oldest black college in the United States. It was founded in 1866. It was formerly called Shore College. And until this day, Sister McKinney says that she continues to study and research in the meta -nature. Sister McKinney, would you please come forward? Our topic is the state of meta nature, where we go from here. Duaru in a shark, wait in a shark, in a shark, salu, salu. Um, I am so glad to be here with you today. Um, I have come all the way from Mississippi, where I'm living now, just to be here at this conference today because I thought it was so important. And it's a dream of mine for so many years. The intent of this conference uh, is really to focus on mid-dimension and its study and our learning of meta nature. Uh, as Rosalind just mentioned a moment ago, it's not a dead language. It is very much alive. And we need to approach it as a living language. And I'm going to tell you why in my presentation today. So um, the words that I just greeted you in, in Iraq, you've heard uh, everyone here probably knows these words anyway, but it means greetings to you, Mehu family, Wahid family, uh, in Iraq, Sonu, Sonu, sisters and brothers, Anku um, Jasana, uh, meaning life, prosperity, and health to you all. E in Chinu, in Peru, Er Jed, Medunetra. I come here today to speak to you about Mega Nature. Uh, it's really important for us to look at where we have been and where we've been going so far with Mega Nature, what we've done up until this point. Uh, in the United States, we've basically been studying the language seriously since the late 70s, early 80s. And now we need to take a look at where do we go from here? And what's the next step? And how can we advance our, our movement in the study and learning and teaching of Mandarin Nature? So the, the, another goal of the conference really is to form a committee, form a, a group of people who help to 
carry out that plan. I brought a plan with me today that I've been working on for years and years and years. I'm not going to address and tell you my plan right now at this lecture. Maybe tomorrow I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But I have a plan. I'm sure that uh, some Dishi has a plan, and many of us have a plan. Dion has a plan. Obin has, has a plan. We've been thinking for such a long time, not only about learning Medinetra, teaching Medinetra, but also actually making uh, Medinetra into a living, spoken language. In the early 60s, we all had an uh, Africans had an idea uh, internationally about having a lingua franca for African people, one language that all African people could agree to speak, um, the same language so that we'd all understand each other since Africans speak thousands of different languages um, on the continent of Africa and throughout the diaspora. So we were, we thought uh, perhaps that Medinetra could be that language because it is like our classical African language. It's classical in the sense that there are thousands of uh, books and papyrus written in this language. So much knowledge, more knowledge than is written in any other classical language. So, and that's what we really mean by classical. And that is a language that's abundant, an ancient language that's abundant in literature of all kinds. And that, in fact, Medinetra is for us. So why not have it as the lingua franca of African people? We can bring it to life again. We can revive it again. We can speak it again. And uh, you'll hear more than once in this conference today, I'm sure, that that's been done in modern times with other languages, particularly with Hebrew, which was a dead language. And when the State of Israel was formed, uh, their scholars, their thinkers got together and revitalized an ancient language, taking into account all of the other forms of, of Hebrew that were spoken all over the planet, and made it into a spoken language. We can do this with Medinetra. This, is, this was the dream, really, of Shakanta Diyar. This is the main thing that he dreamed of and that he wanted more than anything else, and that is to revive Medinetra as a living spoken language. Wouldn't we all like to be able to speak Medinetra? And it's very possible, just like I spoke it, we've heard it, uh, some Kapra and doing the rituals today with speaking Medinetra. Not just the greetings, but there's so many things we can use it for. We can do rituals every day in our lives, uh, speaking Medinetra. We need to learn the rituals in Medinetra. Don't we, need, don't we want to know how to say the rituals in Medinetra? Uh, don't we want to know how to, to communicate with with each other in Medinetra, don't we want to know how to read the ancient text? We want to do so much with Medinetra. It is a living language, and we just want to bring more life into it so that more of us know it and more of us can speak it. Um, when I talk about where we are now, one of the things is that I can say about that is that it's only known by a handful of people. Uh, only a small number, a small percentage of people really know or have even heard of Medinetra. After almost 30 years of serious study that our scholars have been uh, doing with Medinetra. So I'm going to talk about a lot of uh, some aspects of it. Uh, one is learning a living language and what that means, how to learn Medinetra, how to learn a living language. The problems with uh, Medinetra as a living language and a plan for resurrecting and reviving the language and spreading uh, basic things, basic usable uh, aspects of Medinetra to all people. So, if I can begin. Um, I teach, as you just heard, Chinese and French both of those two languages at Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi. I've only been teaching for three years, those two languages. Of course, I asked them if I could speak Medinetra, teach Medinetra there, and I did give them an idea of a curriculum that I could use, but no, they weren't interested. The Chinese and French was much more palatable to them. Um, 
However, um, what we want to do, as I was saying, was revive into um, a living, usable, spoken language. Because by doing that, we will also learn more about its culture. Language is the embodiment of culture. And in order to really understand and learn a culture, the best way to do that is to learn a language. And I would even go as far to say that the only way to really learn the culture of another people is to learn its language, because it's all there in the language. Um, if you try to learn it by translations or what other people say about the culture, uh, you will be missing a whole lot of very important aspects of the culture, the most important, the most important aspects of it you will be missing. Let us look at the method that we've been um, using, the pedagogy that we've been using to learn in the nature so far. Uh, so far, we've been addressing it as a language of study, something of great interest that we study. We, we know that one of our goals is to learn how to read, and so we study the grammar books ardently, um, and we go through the grammar books, we learn the vocabulary, we learn the alphabet, we learn how to write, and then, um, and then we learn to read some of the text. And that is what we've been doing so far. We do this in indiv as individuals, or we do it as a group in, in groups. But what we have not been doing is we haven't been learning it so that we can use it. And that is why we, as African people, want to learn many nature so that we can use it. European scholars have been studying many nature for, for, for centuries. Actually, the study of many nature is dates back to ancient times, to the Greeks and the Romans. They were studying it, and it's never stopped. But other people, when they studied the language, they studied it as a scholarly endeavor just wanting to know what the text is, and maybe using it, using that information for whatever purposes that they might have. But we as African people, we want to, we want to embody this language, our language. We want to speak it, we want to use it, we want to breathe it, we want to live it, we want to learn its rich culture. There is so much there for us to use. But we have not been learning and studying Mandarin as a living language. I teach two living languages, Chinese and French. And so I, as I've been teaching these living languages, I've had a real opportunity to reflect upon what could we do better and what could we do differently in making our language study much more useful to us. You know, when you walk in the lot in the in the airport, when I was walking in the airport, I saw several stands, Rosetta Stone. Does everybody know what Rosetta Stone is? It is a method for learning a living language. And Rosetta Stone is uh, available in over 150 different languages. And this is uh, the Rosetta Stone method. It's what we call an immersion method. That means you use visual, audio, um, uh, listening, visual, audio, writing, reading, everything. And you just emerge yourself. You only hear the language itself. You don't hear any English at all. And the goal is then that you will go through this repetition over and over and over again until you actually get to the point where you can speak the language and use the language. Um, this is somewhat, well, we can actually use Rosetta Stone too. We can have like Medi Nature in Rosetta Stone. But we can definitely, and we definitely need to, need to move on to a more living language method of teaching our language. Because right now, we are using a grammar center that is in the book. You know how it is. You have the book, you go home, you study the lesson, you do the exercise after you finish the le lesson, and then you can read a few sentences. And by the way, the sentences that you read in Gardner's grammar, Faulkner's grammar, Alice's grammar, and all of the other grammars have, are not the ones you really want to use in everyday life. 
They're not the ones that are usable anyway. You, all you can say when you're finished is, I know how to put the sentence together. I know the sentence structure and I know some new words. But how can I use these sentences in my life? And you can't for the most part. Let's go beyond that. And that's one of the things that we're going to do here. And the forming a panel and forming a group to carry it beyond that. Let's uh, look at a living language. How, when I teach my classes, I, the first thing I do is have my students read a book called How to Learn a Foreign Language. Because I don't take it for granted that all my students are going to know how to learn a foreign language in the first place. As a matter of fact, the most interesting third thing I've ever heard from one of my French students one day, he said, I've never studied a, a foreign language in my whole life. I only know English. And this, this language, this French, he said, it's so foreign. And it was just, it just floored me because um, that, that statement, he, was, he, he, not, he meant the language was foreign, yes, but he also meant the whole process of learning the language was foreign, yes. And he also meant that, can I, this child from inner city Detroit really learn how to speak another language? You know, so many of us really don't even believe that we can actually learn how to speak another language, let alone learn how to speak that nature, um, a language that is no longer spoken. But we can, and that's what that book is all about, how to learn a foreign language. Anyway. Is it by you? No. <laughs> it's a very old book, actually. Written someplace in the, in the late twenties. Uh, learning a language is about a lot of things. It's about learning new sounds. You know, languages have sound, and I'm going to talk about the sounds of metametric because I know you're saying, well, it's so ancient. How would we know what the sounds are? How would we know how it sounds? And how how can we actually uh, replicate or duplicate or revive those sounds? But it's about learning new sounds and rhythms. Language has rhythm. Language has movement. Language uh, and that many nature had rhythm and it had um, sounds and it had tones. Languages have attitude. You know the attitude that we speak with when we speak English or we speak any any language. We always have a lot of attitude in our language. Many nature had attitude as well. Uh, languages have grammars. You need to know the sentence structure, the verbal structure, um, the tenses. You need to know all the grammar of a language. Um, and languages uh, have concepts. And one of the main concepts that languages have is the concept of time. And a lot of languages have different concepts of time. For example, um, in nature, we say that's no tense. Tense means time. That means we don't talk about past tense, present tense, future tense. When we study metamnetural, we do, because that's all we know. And so we try to put everything in at time. We try to 